Dr. Gentry? Present. Gentry's present. Ms. Elrod? Present. Silva's present. Ms. Masters? Present. Ms. Masters is present. Mr. Little? Ms. Bush? I'm here to speak. Ms. Present. Uh, Ms. Bugs? Present. Player Peters? Present. Super Walker? Present. Ms. Tyler? Present. I'm All sure there are eight have, present. Thank you. We have a quorum. We'll move forward with uh, awards and recognitions as it appears on our agenda with national award certifications. Dr. Severe, I'll kick it to you. I believe uh, Dr. Barnes is going to handle that. Okay. That is our HR chief, Chris Barnes. Good evening, Madam Chair. Good evening, board. Uh, we have a video to show you first, and then I will be back up to speak with you afterwards briefly. Thank you. Hold on. currently don't have any audio. Okay, hold on. Do you want me to give it a try on my, my computer? Someone who understands the craft of teaching and learning, but also understands super effective reflection. Um, it's an endorsement that says this is a teacher who is constantly thinking about his or her practice and therefore constantly improving. I decided to seek national board certification because during my third and fourth years of teaching, I was looking for another opportunity to grow as an educator and a leader. The MBCT program requires that teachers describe what they know about their students, analyze their students' work, and reflect upon their strengths and weaknesses as an educator. And all of this over a longer period of time, not just in one specific lesson. Uh, the number one way in which it's helped me to serve my students is it made me consistently more reflective as a teacher, uh, what works, what doesn't work, um, why certain students seem to take to subject material presented a certain way and why others need a different way. It has been proven and there, there's plenty of research on national board certification and teachers who are national board certified actually have statistically more significant success with their students and so it's something that is not just good for resume but it really is good for students um, especially the wide range of different students that we have in metro schools um, and it is uh, it, you really will be helping your students in addition to really um, helping yourself as a professional. So within MNPS, we have a significant cohort of nationally board certified teachers and they occupy 
They occupy roles and positions all over the district. They're in classrooms, they're in guidance counselor offices, they're in administrative roles, they're here at central office. And all of these are individuals who are passionate about their experiences, uh, not just their experiences since earning certification, but the experience of the certification journey. Um, National Board was one of the most powerful pieces of professional development that I've had in my teaching career. Uh, and it's going to uh, force you to really look at students individually and also to think about what they need in order to move them to mastery. And it's very authentic because you are having the ultimate professional development experience with the students that you have in front of you at that time, which may be a little bit different from other types of professional development, which is more generalized. So this is customized for you as an educator and for your students for where they are and who they are in that time frame. If we have more and more teachers pursuing this type of professional learning, that impact is going to have legs that move further faster. And we're going to, we're going to really affect the educational experiences that kids are having. We're also gonna affect the learning experiences that adults are having. Go for it. I know there's a lot of hesitation because of the cost of the program, uh, the work it entails, and then there's nerves, like, am I a good enough teacher to get national certification? What I say to the cost is you get it back tenfold in the success of your students and the success of furthering your craft. Uh, as far as the work, you're already doing the work every day in the classroom, so with national boards, it's just a way to self-reflect and write it all down and then share it so that other people can see what you're doing as a great teacher. Becoming a National Board Certified Teacher did not make me all of a sudden a picture perfect. Give me a process for overcoming challenges don't go. And a responsibility to know and as a teacher I can overcome those. Again, thank you. Sorry for the technical difficulty. We wanted to have a chance, uh, HR wanted to have a chance to showcase and highlight some great teachers who are really taking their instruction to the next level by obtaining this nationally recognized certification with national boards. It's also available to other professional certi certi certificated employees as well. But we have a chance now, I wanted to recognize several of our teachers who've received national boards over the last year or two. We want to recognize Cynthia Jones, Laura Hutchinson, Constance Wade, Laura Fredrickson, Deborah Higgins, Constance Wade, Laura, Laura Fredrickson, Deborah Higdon, James Campbell, Megan J. Rowe, Hannah Strickland, Tamika Marshall, Tina, Tina Amaluke, Janet Malone, Jason Chatham, Dietrich May, Sonia Ware, Kiona Johnson, Katie Jarrett, and Holly Rang. And our latest recipient is Tanoa, Dr. Tanoa Witzkel. As a recognition, HR has purchased these foam boards that teachers will be able to put outside their classrooms to help other teachers know if they're looking to pursue that certification as well and to help recognize the excellent work that they did. We appreciate the board supporting professional development in ways for our teachers to get better at their craft. And we just wanted a brief opportunity to recognize those individuals with you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Barnes. We appreciate it and congratulations to our board certified teachers. Uh, I meant to mention earlier, we are hosting this uh, meeting virtually pursuant with uh, executive orders by Governor Lee. Uh, spread of COVID has been high, so we are maintaining our public participation opportunity by having community members come in through one door, present to us, speak with us, and then leave out of another door. With that in mind, we will slide right into public participation with our very first presenter, Ms. Amy Pate.
All right, Nashville community, we're having just a few technical difficulties. We want to make sure that not only are all board members able to hear public participation participants, but also that the listening public is able to hear. So if you'll give us just a few minutes to rectify this shortly. Everyone else turned off. Everybody off. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. okay. Schools have been closed for 300 days. Last March, teachers went into action, setting up Google Classrooms, printing packets, trying to reach their students, but you made them stop and wouldn't allow instruction. You had four months to plan before school started in August, yet when that time came, and by your own metrics, we should have been in person, you weren't ready. You didn't have a plan. On October 13th, third and fourth grade went back to school, but were out by Thanksgiving. You abruptly canceled fifth and sixth grade return, furthering parent distrust. 300 days. I don't want to speak here tonight. We're tired. And I acknowledge the privilege that allows me to leave work, have transportation and childcare, knowledge to sign up, and no fear of reprisal. I speak for myself and my kids who suffer greatly from your decisions, but I also speak for the parents who don't speak English, who can't leave work, and have given up hope that Metro schools will educate kids. I speak for the 33% of kids truant, up from 19% this time last year. I speak for the majority of parents who chose an in-person option on three different surveys and have never gotten it. There's overwhelming evidence from the New England Journal of Medicine, CDC, and American Academy of Pediatrics, to name a few, that schools are safe, do not contribute to community spread, and should be open. Ms. Elrod said, cases within MP MNPS during in-person did not affect community spread as we had a low transmission count. Dr. Battle agrees. You have all, except for Ms. Bush, vocally called for schools to be closed and defended your position, all while saying how much you want an in-person choice. All experts agree open schools are best. This is gaslighting of the highest order. You can wish and hope for an in-person choice, but until you plan and implement, do not say in-person is the district default. Ms. Bug says the board does not do the work of the district, and Dr. Battle is given sole responsibility and discretion to make decisions. I have to remind you, however, that your one employee serves at the pleasure of a nine-person board directly elected by parents. To put complete control in the hands of Dr. Battle and not know the answers to what healthcare professionals advise her, what the vaccination plan is, that could have started last week, or if there's a plan to address learning loss is troubling to say the least and shows more failure by this board to hold Dr. Battle accountable. Ms. Tyler and others decry the lack of state, federal, and city help to open schools. I don't disagree, but we knew back in the summer that wasn't coming. Did you really think Mayor Cooper with his son in in-person private school will do anything to help us open? The governor gave us money for PPE and staff, and since 93, 93 of, net, of Tennessee's 95 counties have in-person school, he considers himself successful. My point is, a mask mandate or admonishing the community to social distance won't open schools. We have to dig deep, use the resources we have, and follow science and data, not feelings and bias. In response to if schools would reopen when teachers got the vaccine, Dr. Bettle said no, because COVID is so prevalent in the community and our schools are very much part of the community. Although community spread does not factor into school spread, as she has admitted, I do agree schools are part of the community and our community is completely open, except for public schools. Every private and neighboring county is open. Every bar, gym, restaurant, tattoo parlor, sporting event, and concert venue are open, but schools are closed for 300 days. What are you telling our students? That rich kids can go to school, but poor kids can't? You make these decisions. You have the ability to open schools. You know it's safe and can be done. Do it now. Open schools, especially for special needs, ELL, and the youngest students. Our kids deserve better. Stop failing them. Thank you. Thank you. Next presenter, Carolyn Betts. Whatever. Okay. Um, my name is Raquel Villagrana. My daughter is at six, is in sixth grade at LCA. This is her second year with Republic Schools. Um, I also signed up for the Parent Involvement Committee. I'm convinced successful education needs parents' involvement. Two things have defined education for my daughter Maria at LCA. First one, the pace that she has had uh, from different from other schools. 
She's gotten to be more disciplined, which was probably a rough change in the beginning, change in the beginning, but she was so encouraged that instead of complaining, she started spending more time on homework and on research. The second huge difference that I have found at LCA has been, which is Liberty Collegiate Academy, a Republic School, Republic School has been open communication with everybody. Maria, Maria can reach um, her teachers when she has any questions and more import, importantly, I can reach them anytime I need anything. Not like uh, it used to be. Uh, when I want to get extra study tools, they reply and email me sites that can help me or when I see that she's eager to read or and to write, I ask for recommendations and how to guide her in literacy and always get help. She has discovered how good she is at writing thanks to LCA and she enjoys it. All her teachers have been great at challenging Maria to bring the best of her, not only academically, but also as a person. We chose LCA because of the academic excellence, even though it was not our school zone and we had to drive to drop her off or pick her up. Good education was more important than convenience. I would also like to talk about computer science education. It involves, in, it involve, involves not only knowing about computers, but also about critical thinking and problem solving skills, which are foundations for any career. I have noticed how Maria has improved in those areas and with that her confidence when she faces a problem has gotten, she has gotten better. Computer science education has helped her on math and that is great. SEA has been the perfect team partner we needed for Maria's education. When we went for the interview, they told us they were very disciplined and we loved that. They have been for this almost two years. They have made our work at home easier and helped us with her academic success. I felt peace of mind when I dropped her off at school and I feel peace of mind when I have to go to work on my 12 or 13 hour shift as a nurse. And I know those teachers that worked hard when it was in prison education are working even harder now to keep the pace and the excellence they are well known for. A random day, I asked Maria who her favorite teachers were, and a nice surprise was that all the ones she mentioned were from a LCA. That school has been to us the academic support we needed for a girl that is already a great student but could get more. I'm honored to belong to the LCA family, and he it has been a great experience for our family. I would love to see more kids. Let me finish this just one sentence. Having this opportunity with Republic schools being renewed, that hope will become a reality. Thank you. That was me. Good evening. My name is Chelsea Rogers. I'm a fifth grade math teacher at Liberty Collegiate Academy. This is my fourth year at LCA and my ninth year being a teacher. My first year at Liberty was a transitional year for me professionally, coming from public elementary education. By the end of my first year, the thing that I noticed and that impacted me the most was that a majority of my scholars coming from a public elementary school were significantly below grade level, but because of our consistently high academic ex expectations, they grew across content and became on or above grade level, even within one school year. This kind of tremendous growth has such a deep impact on our scholars and leads to such significant gains and achievement over their own data year over year, which has scholars at the high school level earning an ACT score that not only gets them into the college of their choice, but also scholarship money towards the rest of their education. To me, this is such an example of living out our mission of reimagining public education in the South. Scholars that attend our schools receive high quality instruction from the best teachers with rigorous curriculum, access to both intervention and acceleration programs, and consecutive years of courses like computer science, which is more than an average middle school student is offered with a public education. Beyond that, we are a family. Parents and teachers have such strong communication, which allows scholars to be consistently supported in the same ways both at home and at school. This has become critical this year with school now being like happening in schoolers in scholars' homes. Even before quarantine, when the tornado hit our community, our network hit the ground running immediately to support families by providing food, arranging assistance with shelter and utilities, all while continuing to provide the same high quality education in a virtual setting. Since then, Republic has continued to support families and scholars, and we lead the way in virtual learning. I could give countless examples of how genuinely thankful I am to be a Republic teacher and have found such an incredible data-driven network that truly lives out their core values and mission statement. Instead, 
I would love to invite each of you to come experience it for yourself by visiting my virtual classroom anytime you'd like. In closing, I'm so grateful that families in Nashville have the ability to choose Republic for their scholars' education. I'm a registered and active voter and you do represent my interests and my interests are best served by the renewal of our school for 10 more years. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Rose. I serve as the assistant principal at Nashville Prep. This is my third year uh, at Nashville Prep and I'm here tonight to urge you uh, to vote in support of renewing uh, our charter authorization at National Prep. Um, <laughs> why am I here right now? Uh, a couple of reasons. I've gotten a chance to work at four different schools uh, in three different states. So I've worked in Mo Montgomery Public Schools, worked for a small charter network uh, in Detroit before I came to Nashville about three years ago. Um, and National Prep uh, has some of the most dedicated, passionate, and talented folks that I've ever worked with across the country. Uh, and I want to give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about. Um, when I talk about, think about talent uh, and the talent of our teachers and staff at National Prep, uh, I can talk about test scores and tell you that uh, my first year at Prep, 14% more kids tested proficient uh, in math on the state test than they did the year before. Uh, I can tell you that even though we've had to switch to a virtual uh, platform this year, we're performing almost at the same grade level in the same uh, way that we were last year in person. Talk about dedication. Uh, I can tell you that we have a staff at National Prep that had to rebuild the way that we did school in just a few short weeks after COVID and, and stay at home orders. Uh, and we're doing that uh, in a way that is unlocking our students' potential even through a computer. And when I talk about we have some of the most passionate staff uh, that I've ever come across uh, at National Prep, we say all the time, uh, the pride's got my back, uh, like a pride of Panthers. Uh, and I've seen folks live out that mission uh, and that statement time after time. Uh, if you type in any teacher's phone at National Prep, if you were to type mom or dad, you probably get their mom or dad, but you also have a hundred numbers uh, from moms and dads of kids that they teach and know that they can reach out via text or a phone call whenever they need help. Um, we have kids who are in high school now who continue to send emails to myself and other teachers of their grades saying like, hey, thank you so much. Uh, you're a part of this journey with me. Um, and anytime I show up at a family function, it could be a sports game, a graduation, Sometimes even a funeral, if you look around, you see folks who are part of the National Prep family in terms of staff uh, and teachers there to support our kids and our families. So in conclusion, thank you for your time uh, and really look forward to y'all uh, renewing our contract moving forward. Thank you. Do I get the balance of this time? <laughs> yes. Into 30 seconds early, no. I uh, just really appreciate y'all being here. I know it's been a challenging year for each of you, so just really appreciate you taking the time and listening to us voters here in Nashville. My name is John Ripka. My address is at 2022 Greenwood Circle, and I'm a Nashville resident. Um, I'm also the head of Republic Schools, and as you know, our schools, Liberty Collegiate, Nashville Prep, and Republic High School is seeking a 10-year renewal this year. Um, I was adopted at the age of seven as a street kid living in Korea, and the first time that I set foot on American soil was right here in Nashville. My first meal in America was a Happy Meal right near the airport on our way home. Uh, my mom is a lifelong educator. She's been a teacher for 30 years before retiring right here in the state of Tennessee. Um, I like to joke that education is in my blood. Um, I deeply, deeply believe that all children in Nashville deserve a fair and high quality education. And I don't make distinctions about Republic schools or charter schools or traditional district schools. Every child, I think you agree, all deserve a fair and public education. Um, we take very seriously our commitment to making sure that every child and every family has a school that is the best fit for their child and their family. And for us, we know that that has a direct impact in breaking cycles of poverty, in the cradle to prison pipeline, in developing a workforce and a viable community here in Nashville. And I think especially given the events that we saw last week, what it means for a community to have shared values and citizenship and what that means particularly for our children in North Nashville and West Nashville. Um, my nephew and nieces are examples of the system of education we have here in Nashville. One attended a Republic school, the other attends the MLK, and they both attend a school that is worthy of their ambitions and their talents and their aspirations. That's why we take immense pride in what we do because we know that education makes a difference. Here in the city of Nashville, uh, Republic High School is only one of two Title I high schools that had a graduation rate above 90%. And we were the only school to do that for the last two years in a row. Um, our middle schools, if you are uh, attending our middle schools, you're 43% likelier to be proficient at reading and you're twice as likelier to be proficient at math. 
we know that education plays a role in breaking the cycles of uh, incarceration, particularly for black and brown youth. And we take that responsibility really seriously. Um, these stats are yet still woefully not good enough. I think we are all committed to making sure 100% of our students have the type of experiences that matches their talents and their aspirations. Um, we all play a role together in making sure that there is a system of great schools for every single family here in Nashville. And I'm uh, asking you to support the renewal to make sure that we can be a part of that solution for all families here in Nashville. Thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. My name is Antoine Welch. Um, happy to be here. Just want to talk a uh, few seconds about a school um, that's near and dear to my heart. It's East End Prep. I have two children who attend East End Prep. I have a nine year old and a 14 year old, a fourth grader and eighth grader. And uh, brief, briefly, I want to tell you about my story. I am um, a young man from Augusta, Georgia, who was born to a 14 year old young lady. Um, and uh, I wasn't given much of a shot to do much of anything in school. I was constantly in trouble in the principal's office are, and uh, pretty much labeled to be um, that kid who's probably going to be somewhere not good. Um, however, through the grace of God and uh, a strong mother, um, I was able to straighten myself up and uh, receive a scholarship to Mars Hill University in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I played sports there and uh, met my wife, got married. And um, during that whole process, I made a decision that um, I would be a great father, no matter what, because I didn't have one. So um, that brings me to East End Prep and what I've seen and what I wanted for my children. Um, my wife had already been working at East End Prep and um, I was watching from afar as my kids grew and developed and the loving, the caring, the leadership, the education, the programs. Um, there was times where I was invited to programs where my kids would be chanting um, uh, affirmations that, that brought tears to my eyes to see other kids just believe and to know where some of those kids came from. And I thought to myself, what if I had that when I was that young? Um, I probably wouldn't have been in the principal's office as much. Um, just having someone tell you that you can do it and you repeating that over and over and having kids uh, achieve goals academically and, and seeing smiles on their face, um, that, that right there took me from the corporate world when an opportunity presented itself at East End Prep. I was all over the school director's office and desk saying, hey, I want to be a part of whatever you're doing here because it's more than dollars. It's it's changing lives. So that's my story um, and my advocacy for East End Prep because it's been a, it's been more than just a school. It's been a second home and a place that I see it changing people's lives. And um, I just want to see it continue. So. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Hello. Um, do I just start or? Okay, thanks. Um, my name is Abigail Garcia. And I am a seventh grader attending Eastern Prep since kindergarten. And really, everything that has happened in the school has made me feel so much better about myself that it's really great. <laughs> um, so Eastern Prep really just, sometimes I think my first day, um, I was really nervous, so I decided to bring a teddy bear with me. And they said that I couldn't bring it in the classroom, but whenever we would use bathroom breaks, I could go visit it. And I was really happy about that and it made me feel comfortable. And every time that things got hard and that I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't do anything, they made sure to talk with me. They made sure to make sure that I was comfortable enough to go on. 
they really bring a great idea of feeling at home. They make sure that when you are bullied, they talk to that person and they talk to you to make you feel better. They have counselors, they have everything. They make sure that if you want to call somebody whenever you're sick or whenever you're not feeling it, um, they make sure to let you talk to them and to talk to whoever you want to and just they make you feel at home. And with learning, they make sure that you are able to succeed in not only life and not only college, but with anything. And a lot of my friends have come through rough backgrounds and I have tried to help them a lot. But I think the better help that they could get was from my teachers because they made sure that they were good in school and they made sure that they were good away from school. And a lot of them were able to provide food and um, sorry, <laughs> uh, I went completely off topic. Uh, but Eastern Prep was able to communicate and to make sure that you had a good ed education and a good life and pretty much they made sure you were okay and that your grades were okay. Um, but really, I think that's all I have to say. Uh, sorry for my nervousness, I get kind of nervous. Great. Great job. Oh, that's all I have to say, so. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Very good. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. How are you doing? My name is Tedrick Robinson. I am a seventh and eighth grade math teacher at Nashville Prep. Um, I joined this um, this community probably about five months ago. This is my first year teaching. Um, in that short time, I seen that the family oriented environment take place, not only with me when they welcome me in, but also in the way we um, deal with our parents and our scholars. After joining this team, um, they, they took on, it took on a shape to where our scholars and families was like just one of our own. So when I, when I, um, when I came in, I, I also want to be one of the ones who didn't want to uh, follow the status quo. I wanted to make sure that all um, children were treated as if their education was most the most important thing um, that they needed. Coming from uh, a low income environment and uh, educational system, yes, I, ex I excel. However, I, I have seen to where curriculum is just based on something that people people just uh, get from anywhere. It's not, to me, it's not just based solely on what our students are doing in that classroom. And at Republic, what we do is we look at the data from uh, what our children are doing in the classroom and we make our lessons based solely on what our students are doing. And I like the way we are reimagining education and not just going along with the status quo. And with that being said, I like to ask you all to make sure that Republic has another 10 years to realign Nashville to a greater to greater heights. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings, my name is April Vera Espinosa and I'm here to proudly represent Easton Prep. I want to start off by saying I have been a part of the community for seven and a half years and I have watched the community develop into a healthy, supporting environment. And I think that's very crucial for not only our students, but for our teachers, because our education is important and we learned that it was our treasure. I learned from the school that I have ethics and morals that I should follow and therefore I was able to function in a community in the real world. Thank you. My name is Bernadette Minger, and I'm sure some of you have probably heard me on the news because I'm just not happy at the response and the reaction that you all have given 
for these children in the public school. And you definitely, for a child like mine who's developmentally delayed, who has an IEP, who needs personal in-person accommodations that's required, you all didn't give that a second thought. As soon as y'all came up with the idea of virtual learning back in January, February, March, or whenever it was, you all should have sent out some sort of email or something offering input from us parents as to how we can go along and move forward during this COVID. But y'all never gave us that option at all. Y'all took it from us from the very beginning and we knew nothing about nothing until it was already implemented. And then y'all had the nerve to insult us by asking us to fill out questionnaires as to whether we want our children to be in person. And then you still took that choice away from us. So then what was the whole point of asking us our opinion if y'all wasn't gonna follow it and, and acknowledge it, even recognize it, address it or anything. And even now, when y'all keeping these schools closed, y'all still didn't consider a daughter like mine, my child, who's developmentally delayed, who's failing her finals, who's failing her courses, because she needs to be in person. And it's a shame that you mothers, y'all mothers, I'm sure y'all either mothers or grandmothers are soon to be. If y'all had children and these were y'all children, y'all would not be happy. And, I, and I'm not understanding how y'all can just be so uncaring and keep these children. I get it. I get it. But those of us who want to have our children in the classroom and those teachers who want to be in the classroom, let us go. Let us be in the classroom. Those who don't, we get it. We understand those are your children. Do what's best for your children and let them stay at home. Let them be virtual. But don't take the, the choice and the option away from us parents who want to have our children in the classroom because the children are supposed to be our future. And right now, the way you're responding, you are ruining these children's future from here on, from this day point forward until years down the line. And they will never be able to recover from this. And you all should be ashamed of yourselves that y'all didn't impl give us parents more choice, more say so than what y'all gave us. Y'all just completely left us out. And that's disappointing. And I just pray that y'all do better in this next school year and beyond. And God bless y'all and have mercy on your souls for, for what y'all doing to these children. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lamont Howard, and I'm a freshman at Father Ryan High School. My academics began here at Easton Prep as one of the founding students. Some of the things I'm involved in at Easton Prep were at Easton Prep was drama club, basketball, track and field, and homecoming court. I've had many great teachers to inspire me to achieve my best academically, such as Mrs. Rhodes, Mr. Lane, and Ms. Norman, just to name a few. Easton Prep is a school that establishes morality and implements a rigorous curriculum. Mr. Lacrone, who is the founder of the school, has very best intentions for every scholar and expects nothing less. He is a constant presence in the building and very accessible. I believe the high expectations of Easton Prep has prepared me for Father Ryan's honor classes, which I am currently enrolled in. I just want to thank Mr. Lacrone for always being there in a time of need. Thank you. My name is Roy Rahimi. I've been going to East End Prep since kindergarten. One of the things I love the most about East End Prep is the family and community you can build. Some of the diff something different from most schools is the teachers make a lifelong bond with you. The board should keep East End Prep open for 10 more years because they, they inspire people and show you something you never knew you had. For example, in the beginning of sixth grade, I didn't really like math. Then it started to become more challenging and exciting. Now I really like math and I wouldn't realize it without East End Prep. I also love the positive, positive environment that encourages you to do the best, and this is the environment that helped many kids in the future. Thank you for giving people a good education and listening to what I think of mine. I look forward to hearing about East End Prep's charter renewal. Thank you so much for your time. Hi, good evening. My name is Julie Rahimi. I'm a parent and I have an eighth grader and a first grader at East End Prep. We have been a part of the EEP fabric for nine years. The pandemic has made me slow down and celebrate even the little things. Like today, the odometer just surpassed 100,000 miles on my car. Woohoo! Many, many of those miles were put 
on by making the 45 minute drive each way from our home in Antioch to East End Prep in East Nashville. I'm grateful to have that choice to make that drive every weekday pre-pandemic. East End Prep is worth it. It holds a special place in my heart. I've watched it grow and transform a grade each year from 200 scholars to now closing in on almost a thousand. The dedication and commitment of the leadership and teachers are what sets it apart from other schools. Many of my eighth grade, my eighth graders, former teachers from her early years have developed and embraced leadership roles. This is a testament to our school leader, Jim LaCrone and his vision. The amazing school culture can be felt immediately interacting with anyone that is involved in school, whether it be Mr. LaCrone, principals, teachers, or scholars. In addition to the laser sharp focus on academics, the importance of character building is also on the forefront. And in these times, kindness matters. Thank you for the honor and privilege to share this with you. It is my hope that you will renew the East End Prep Charter. Thank you. Let's just go. Okay, good evening. My name is Kylie Yancey. I'm an 11th grade, 11th grade scholar at Republic High School. I have been with Republic High School for three years and they have honestly taught me a lot. But I didn't know much because I'm not from here. I'm from Virginia. And when I first moved here, I got kind of got set back and I kind of just thought everything was going to go down from there. And after I went to Republic, things changed. They gave me more of a challenge that I've been wanting. Um, I'm, I'm extremely grateful, honestly, because they kind of opened my mind up more. They made me more open to, to things I would never do. I started to do more, be more athletic and do robotics. I joined clubs I never thought I would be good enough for. They made me feel like my big family. They made me feel comfortable because being the only child, it does get lonely. So school was kind of like my getaway to be around people where I could really finally be feel comfortable. Mm. Honestly, I want Republic to stay open because I don't even, I don't know what I would do without them, honestly. I've came a long way. I've struggled. I went, even when I failed, they were there for me when I was crying and I thought I was dumb. Like I had a day where I just thought I was dumb because I couldn't pass the simple math test. But I honestly came far. They were by my side. They made me feel like I was loved even times where I didn't feel like it, but I don't know what I would do without them. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Amanda Gansberger, and I have two daughters at H.G. Hill Middle School in sixth and eighth grade. Up until now, we have had a wonderful in-person school experience. I love public school. I love everything everybody has done so far, and I wanna continue to love it with my children getting back to school. So I just would really, really beg you to change your mind about the metrics and how you've made your decisions, especially now in the face that teachers are being offered the vaccine. At some point, we've just got to take that step and be brave and get back to school. And um, I just want you to be maybe a little more honest and transparent with parents. Is it purely staffing issues? Do you really plan on getting back this year? Because I'm a working mom. I know a lot of other working moms people that can't afford, don't have family to get back up and make these plans. So that does get to be important, especially in the months to come. And um, I just think, you know, giving people false hope, being real about it, I think needs to be done at this point. Um, as far as the kids falling behind, I really try to be active and engaged in their academics but it is really, really hard. I'm not a teacher. You guys are the ones that do great with this. And there has been great email response and things, but there's nothing like in-person school. There's nothing like being able to show them a question, 
and have an answer. And I think we need to see that happen. Um, as far as the detriments to children, I think haven't really been voiced and haven't really been addressed too much as much as they need to be. The isolation with kids and the depression. I have older kids. I can't imagine those young kids that go to kindergarten, not just to learn their colors, but to learn how to be functional members of society. They need to get back there and do that. You can't learn kindergarten online. So I think trying to address those issues or, or at least acknowledge them more would be really helpful for me. And just to wrap up with the personal story, my daughter's on a laptop online, which is obviously mobile. I go in there and check on her as much as she can if I'm at, uh, off for the day. She's in bed. She's literally in bed in front of the screen all day. And it's killing me. It's really, really sad to see. And I think we need to move forward and get these kids back to school. Thank you so much. Good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Tom Gilroy, and I'm here to speak on behalf of Republic uh, Charter Schools and Republic High School specifically. Before I get started, I want to take just a few moments to give me some background information on myself. This is my 22nd year in education. The first 20 I spent in the state of Pennsylvania teaching at two of the highest achieving schools in that state, one, one being Central Buck School District and the other one being Dallas School District. In 2019, I decided to come here because I heard the calling from Republic High School. Took a phone interview, came down, interviewed, got to see the high school, got to see the way it worked, and I was sold. I was bought in. I came down. So today I, I, I'm greeting you as uh, the academic dean of the arts and humanities for Republic High School. I'm currently in my second year with the organization and my 22nd year in education. I, I moved to Tennessee, as I said, in 2019 from Pennsylvania to take a position at RHS because of the mission and the opportunity to make an impact in the lives of students while continuing to build a high school that pushes scholar results in a way that reimagines education. The work I've done at Republic is hard. The hours are long. The work is extensive, but at the end of the day, there's no greater reward than seeing the successes of our students. High expectations are set for every member of the Republic family, whether you're a leader, a teacher, or a student. We believe that adults are the lever for student growth, and we will continue to push and refine our own practices for the betterment of our scholars. Likewise, our expectations of scholars include working on rigorous grade level assessments while moving towards independent learning skills that will allow them to have success in whatever post-secondary plan they choose to pursue. When I think of why it's important to renew Republic's charter for another 10 years, I think of a personal example. I think of a student named Steven, who I had the pleasure of teaching last year. He's an extremely bright human being who never thought of college as a fit for him. He believed his best option was to continue to work in construction because he was making good money. And working with him on a daily basis, he eventually came to the realization that if he went to college, he could run or own his own construction company and make more money than he would as a laborer. The future looks bright for him as he is currently enrolled in MTSU's construction management program and through financial aid and scholarships is essentially paying nothing. As if all this weren't enough, his sister who is currently in the seventh grade at Republic Schools is talking about where she wants to go to college because she wants to be like her big brother. I don't care what your experience level is with education. If a school is having this kind of success and an impact on the community, we should all truly want to see this partnership continue. In closing, I would like to invite you to contact me and come visit our school. So contact me, feel free. Thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Mehreen Butt, and I'm the Academic Dean of Instruction for Science and Computer Science at Republic High School. This is my eighth year in education and my fifth year at Republic Schools. I previously served as the AP Computer Science Principal's teacher for three years before moving into my current role. I'm a proud member of the RHS and Republic community because of our commitment to providing all scholars 
with a computer science education that prepares them with the 21st century skills required to succeed in college and the career of their choice. On average, tech jobs are among the highest paid occupations in the US, but only 15% of the current tech industry identifies as black or Latinx. The same is true for APCSP, where only 13% of exams are taken by black or Latinx students. At Republic, we are building a different narrative where all of our students will graduate having taken this critical CS class. We are so proud to share that 70% of our RHS scholars who sat for the AP exam in 2020 passed with a three or higher. That equates to 75 scholars who received college credit in this course alone as a 10th grade student. Our scholars surpassed the average score in the state of Tennessee, outperformed scholars globally, and our underrepresented students, female, black, and Latinx scholars had a higher passing rate than the state and global average. Another component of our CS program is building partnerships with tech leaders and companies here in Nashville. Recently, I was named one of just three finalists for the Diversity and Inclusion Advocate of the Year Award by the Nashville Technology Council. This recognition is a direct result of the community partnership we at Republic are building with Pivot Technology School, a local tech boot camp committed to increasing the number of the underrepresented minorities in the field of tech. To support the development of this partnership, the Vela Foundation awarded us a $25,000 grant. Students enrolled in this program will graduate with a digital portfolio of projects and an industry recognized certification in front end web development, which will open more job opportunities for our students. Through our commitment to a rigorous high quality CS education, we are providing all of our scholars with a unique opportunity to build real world skills so that our scholars can thrive in the local Nashville economy. I personally wish to extend an invitation to each of you to visit our CS classrooms to see the work we are doing. I am so proud of our scholars' accomplishments and proud to be a member of the Republic family. Please support the renewal of the middle schools and high school, which ensures six years of consecutive computer science training for Republic students and the continued push for equity in the field of technology to create a more diverse tech pipeline right here in Nashville. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Celeste LaRue and I'm a resident in Davidson County with a son that used to go to school in, in this district. And I'm here to address uh, a, a potential solution to help get children back into schools before the end of the year. After struggling with consistent classroom learning for so long, returning to it seems uncertain. A virtual learning solution is inconsistent and disruptive to students and their families. So on January 18th, I think we keep our fingers crossed. The 42nd largest school district in the country with 88,000 students is a huge responsibility. With no crystal ball, we wonder if we will ever be safe again, even with a vaccine. Imagine we could be safe without fogging the air with toxic and costly chemicals, periodic treatments, wiping down desks, doorknobs, and light switches to fight an invisible enemy. What if we could get back to the classroom and parents to work, as opposed to fixing a broken virtual learning alternative for which we were not prepared? Consider infusing upcoming federal funding to mitigate learning losses versus stopgap solutions that aren't very effective or strategic. The choir here knows one in five students are failing due to mastery of virtual learning, even after investing $18 million, excuse me, for net books for 90,000 students. The governor named 2021 the most challenging school year in Tennessee's history, which calls us to be diligent and open-minded to explore innovative solutions. There is a better way without technological obsolescence for a capital solution backed by independent studies proven to make it a game changer for Metro Nashville Public Schools. A technology called CASPER, which stands for Clean Air Surface Pathogen Reduction, was developed in Europe 10 years ago. Since May, CASPER is now available outside the U.S. hospital market and now in Tennessee just this month. It's installed in the ductwork of your HVAC system. CASPER uses photocatalysis to convert air and moisture into highly effective oxidizing molecules of hydrogen peroxide. These molecules seek out mold, allergens, fungus, bacteria, and viruses to destroy them within 24 hours at a physical, not chemical level with 99.96% efficacy. Approved by the ETA, the CASPER system is easy to install uses no chemicals, no labor, no ozone, no filtration. It's continuous, safe, organic, and cost-effective in killing pathogens 24-7 on all surfaces in the indoor air we breathe, including the virus that causes COVID-19. 
Now at airport terminals, hotels, restaurants, and prison systems, over a dozen schools have reduced absenteeism and closures in Louisiana, Georgia, and Florida. Lastly, Casper's Transit Unit won the Metro Transit Award in Innovation and is launching a pilot for New York's public transit system next month. Casper can even get school buses back on the road. Through no fault of our own, our education system is deteriorating. The highest achievement is finding the balance between protecting our students while delivering superior education. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Uh, So move. Mr. So Sharon, I'm second. Thank you, Dr. Gentry. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Do I have any discussion before we call for a roll call vote? Sorry, I was having uh, trouble. Are we voting on the consent? I was like, Christian, yeah. this is Rachel, and I can't hear you. Yeah, you're real muffled. I'm sorry again without my mask. Can you hear me now? A little better. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. I'll get real close to the computer so you can hear me. All right, so do we have... Um, a request to move anything from the consent agenda. If not, we're, we're going to vote. It's been moved and seconded. I, this is Rachel Ann. I um, would like to have an amendment to the consent agenda as listed. All right, Dr. Severe, are there any parliamentary procedures to undo the motion and second? Uh, Chair Bugs, I'm not sure sure that everyone knew there was a motion. I think that there was a, a motion and a second, but but I think you're probably okay uh, to sort of start this re, yeah. re well, ring the bell we'll start it <laughs> on this. That's an okay. okay. Second. I just, I took a guess that we were on considering it. <laughs> really? Yeah. Really, well, Dr. Gentry. Okay. Um, be supportive. All right. All right. So we'll, we're going to take it back. We have, I appreciate that. We have the consent agenda. Um, Vice Chair Elrod, you would like to make an amendment. What's your amendment request? I would like to pull, let me make sure the numbers haven't changed. Uh, 1B10, the Metropolitan, Metropolitan National, National Public, Public, Health. Public Health Department. Yes, please. All right, we'll, we'll remove that for consideration. Any other amendments to the consent agenda as it's listed? All right, with that amendment, do I have a motion? So Sharon a Gentry, second. I move approval of the consent agenda with the said omission. Thank you. Do I have a second? Can I second this? Okay, I second. All right, we're going to, if there's no discussion, we'll go ahead and call, have a roll call vote. Dr. Sevier? Dr. Gentry? Aye. Dr. Gentry votes aye. Ms. Selrod? Aye. Ms. Elrod votes aye. Ms. Masters? Aye. Ms. Masters votes aye. Mr. Little? Aye. Mr. Little votes aye. Ms. Bush? Aye. Ms. Bush votes aye. Ms. Player Peters? Aye. Ms. Player Peters votes aye. Ms. Aye. Pippa Walker? Aye. Aye. Pippa Walker votes aye. Ms. Tyler? Aye. Ms. Tyler votes aye. Chair Bugs? Aye. Chair Bugs votes aye. Madam Chair, there are nine ayes. All right. The consent agenda has been accepted. Uh, we'll now move to the amendment. We'll be looking at 10 Metropolitan, I'm sorry, 1B10, Metropolitan National Public Health Department. Uh, take it away, Ms. Elrod. I unmute myself. Give me one second so I can pull it up and make sure I'm reporting some of these numbers correctly from our agenda packet. If you don't mind giving me one second, I accidentally pulled up the expired agenda packet and I want to make sure I'm speaking correctly. Okay. 
Um, and it's in case anybody else is following along on page 16 of 19 of the agenda packet that Ms. Bobo sent on Friday. So the um, this contract is to increase and not to exceed the contract value of 35.8 million um, and it's for school nurses. Um, I'm trying to make sure that we have a conversation on the board floor of why we're increasing our school nurse needs and um, uh, ask questions about how many how many nurses will this provide? Um, why are we needing this increase of numbers uh, or increase of cost and all of that is what I'm trying to to have a discussion on. So my first question would be, how many nurses are we receiving at the 35.8 million? Um, thank you for your question, Ms. Elrod. Um, I'm going to ask um, um, Michelle um, Springer, our Chief of Student Services, and Hank Clay to come on camera to um, address your questions. I think we need to address the amount um, as well. So, um, Dr. Springer and um, Mr. Clay, if you all could come on camera, please. Dr. Springer can hop in here as she as she wishes, but Ms. Elrod, um, the purpose of this is to, um, especially during this moment of public health crisis, to use all available resources to provide um, adequate level of nursing. This has been a long-term goal of Metro National Public Schools. Um, we've not been able to fund it with state and local funds previously, um, they uh, because it's expensive to do so. Um, but with the addition of the CARES Act, we work to be able to allocate some of that money for this purpose um, so that students who may be feeling ill, as we know nurses are those who are doing contact tracing uh, when we have a safe availability to return to schools. And so that's the purpose of it. Dr. Springer, would you like to add any other details? Uh, no, uh, Mr. Clay, I believe that you uh, captured that well. Again, just um, reiterating the need to increase the level of support to not only our students, uh, but our staff in the midst of, of a pandemic. So, you know, their roles have expanded beyond the day-to-day -day, um, support that you normally would find, students with a headache, students with a stomach ache, uh, take your temperature too, um, helping to monitor for symptoms um, and help to help schools to, you know, maintain um, a safe environment uh, to the maximum extent possible. Thank you. My follow-up question, if I may ask it, is it's my understanding that we historically don't have uh, nurses actually inside of our schools except for children with specific care plans. Um, and so this allows, we have historically just not had that. Um, and we, when we were in person this year, we had nurses uh, that we have hired through this contract as stated uh, with the Metro Health Department um, who did all the contact tracing and additional care of students and teachers and facility um, maintenance really with COVID-19. Um, and so I guess my follow-up to that is if we are having, are we still planning on having with this 30 5.8 million, is it still only one nurse per school as we were planning to do last semester or like, or as we had did last semester at the 12.8 million? It's just an increase of schools instead of an increase of nurses. Am I on mute? No. We, we can hear you, Ms. Tyrod. Thank you for your question. Um, so the purpose of this is to continue the at least one per school. Um, there are some schools that have multiple per school based on their student uh, population and the needs of those students. Um, but we had some schools who shared a nurse. And so our goal was to ensure that there was at least a nurse present in that every single school all the time uh, when we're in session. So Dr. Springer, would you add anything specific? And uh, Mr. Gossage, if you have any specific details about this contract uh, be, uh, would welcome that as well. 
Yes, Hank, um, you hit it right on the, uh, the nose with the multiple nurses in each school. Um, some nurses have up to, you know, uh, four to eight nurses, depending on the need. And so um, while, you know, some schools are small and they may be able to share a nurse, shared a nurse in the past, we want to make sure that we expand that so that a principal, a student, a staff has access to a nurse um, all day long um, instead of the, the split situation that has occurred in the past. And I'll just kick it to uh, Mr. Gossage if he has anything specific. Uh, only thing I would have to add is it, we're not increasing 35.8 million. It is to 35.8 million. The increase is 12 million eight hundred thousand dollars, and it is not through just the end of this year, but it's through June 30, 2022. So we're looking at it going out another year as well. Thank you for correcting me there. I knew I had misspoke. Um, I apologize. I had. I had a kid run in the room and I got a little distracted. <laughs> um, so I, I appreciate that. I just want to make sure that we are acknowledging that we still have at least one nurse uh, per school. They have these huge um, responsibilities, particularly with the amount of contract tracing that we're having to do when we're back in school in person. And so um, I just wanted to verify that we were still going to try to follow at least the one per school um, and that it was continued. So I appreciate that clarification that it was not just through the school year, but in, uh, for in the future as well. So I appreciate it. I have no further questions, Chair Bugs, if there's anybody else that has a discussion. Thank you for that, Ms. Elroy. We have a question from Mrs. Poopa Walker. Go right ahead. So I'm worried that we're gonna hire a lot of nurses and then not be able to pay for them in a couple of years. It, is the goal here to try to find that funding in 22-23 or um, it, what are we thinking on that? That's Pippa Walker, thank you for that question. Um, so we also anticipated that, um, of course, this is a long-term uh, strategic priority for the district that we've not been able to fund so far. So we'd love to find the ongoing funding while we have um, either ESSER or CARES Act, depending on how you want to talk about it, we'd like to continue this, um, but with the knowledge that we can't guarantee long-term uh, sustainability, we've asked the public health department to contract for these particular nurses. So that's clear that's for a specific time period and that we don't build in the expectation that it could be longer. Okay, that's helpful. And do we feel like we can find the nurses? I know there's such a demand now. The public health department has um, uh, jumped head into this process. Um, you're correct, there is a huge demand for nurses, um, but uh, as they've gone through their hiring fair, they're down to the, uh, they've either completed it or down to the last few um, uh, in, in an effort to, to build up their, their reserves. Thank you. All right, thank you for all who participated. Any other questions around uh, the Metropolitan Health Public Health Department, um, the contract? All right, then I will entertain a motion in a second so we can vote. Do I have a motion? I move that we um, vote to approve this contract. All right, then. Ms. Second. Mathis, thank you. I'll Do second. I have a second? I'll second. I'll second. This is Ms. Tyler. Uh, all right, I have a, a second from Ms. Tyler. Any further discussion? All right, Dr. Severe, would you mind doing a roll call vote? Dr. Gentry? Aye. Dr. Gentry votes aye. Ms. Elrod? Aye. Ms. Elrod votes aye. Ms. Masters? Aye. Ms. Masters votes aye. aye. Mr. Little? Aye. Mr. Little votes aye. Ms. Bush? Aye. Ms. Bush votes aye. Uh, Ms. Player Peters? Aye. Ms. Player Peters votes aye. Ms. Poopa Walker? Aye. Ms. Poopa Walker votes aye. Ms. Tyler? Aye. Ms. Tyler votes aye. Chair Bugs? Aye. Chair Bugs votes aye. Madam Chair, you have nine ayes. All right, so our consent agenda is passed. Uh, next, we have our director's report. Dr. Battle, I'll send it to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. No problem. Uh, 
And I will jump right in as soon as we get the PowerPoint presentation up. In the meantime, if you need to stretch your legs, take a second to do so, and we'll be ready to jump right in if we can go back to the first slide. All right, um, again, we'll jump right in. Thank you, board members, for the opportunity to update you on several important things happening here at MMPS as we prepare to meet the needs of our students in this extraordinary environment, as well as when we return to a sense of normalcy. My cabinet and our central office teams have been working together to establish a sense of who we are and where we're going as a district, both in the short term to tackle the challenges posed by the pandemic, as well as our larger term goals that speak to what it means to be a part of Team MMPS. This month's director reports will focus on our students. Our strategic frameworks goal one, which is to create an environment that promotes active engagement and consistent improvement in academic achievement among pre-K through 12 students from all backgrounds and programs. This evening's updates addresses all four categories. Strategy one, which is to deliver high quality pre-K-12 instruction and increase the relevance and rigor of the pre-K-12 curriculum. Strategy two, provide equitable access across MMPS schools and clusters to a high quality, well-rounded pre-K-12 education. Strategy three, to establish positive school culture and climate and respond to pre-K-12 students' physical, social, and emotional needs. And strategy four, expand and strengthen the quality of educational programs available to pre-K through 12 students and parents. Next slide, please. It appears to be frozen. All right, there we go. One second. Ground in the work we do on continuous improvement will be these four core tenets. Understand that these core tenets are central office commitments to you and our schools. They define how district leaders and departments will align their work to support you in specific and personalized ways, which are all grounded in our strategic framework. The tenets are to re-envision central office as a support hub. At its core, central office's most important role is to support schools through collaborative partnerships. Our next core tenet is to empower and equip leaders at all levels. By elevating leadership at all levels will mean that all of our efforts will be multiplied. And when we say all, we mean all le leaders every employee of Metro National Public Schools tapping in to their expertise and their skill sets so that they're empowered and equipped to do what's best in supporting our students. The next core tenet is to create and support engaging, rigorous, and personalized learning experiences for all students. Personalization of supports to schools is the key to achieving success at every tier. And then last but not least, to identify and eliminate inequities. With schools, central office can help remove barriers for students and families. Um, important that we move beyond the surface and continue to dig deep and have what might be considered uncomfortable conversations about what it's gonna to take to provide um, equitable experiences for all of our students. Together, these core tenets guide us to our North Star, which is to establish MMPS as the premier large school district in Tennessee and beyond. Now, in many ways, we have demonstrated that MMPS is a district on the move and the district to watch. We have led the way in how to support students during the virtual learning um, through Navigators. You've heard about it, a first of its kind program. Again, we cannot minimize the collaborative effort to become a one-to-one -one district. Definitely thankful for all the partnerships that it took to um, realize this outcome for our district. It was a significant step toward equity that will push teaching and learning to higher heights. 
not to mention all of the innovation that is happening across the district in response to this constant state of change. I am confident that with our North Star to guide us, there is no limit to what we can do together for Nashville students and families. Now, how this directly impacts students is through our focus outcomes, which are a new way for the district to chart students' individual progress, monitor school level data, and promote equity across the district. These academic and SEL outcomes are grounded in the district's belief that every student should be seen, known, and cared for. In essence, we are creating small classroom experiences in a district that serves 80,000 plus students whose global cultures and backgrounds contribute to Nashville's identity and character. So imagine a system that can meet the needs of individual students and establishes high expectations of support from the district. That is what these focus outcomes will do for the district. Similar to KPIs, the focus outcomes are the district's academic and SEL targets, representing what we know are the requirements of student success and on-time progress towards becoming a ready graduate. They also require us to be innovative, collaborative, and strategic consistently. Focus outcomes then mean that we have to develop a new way of working together and strengthening central office and principal partnerships. The focus outcomes will help us to ensure that every student is known, meaning that we will be ensuring that each child has the goals and supports in place to be on track to meet focus outcomes in the areas of literacy, numeracy, attendance, social emotional learning, and transitions either from one school level to the next or to post-secondary opportunities. We have identified focused outcomes for students in grades pre-K through four, grade five, six through eight, nine and 10, and 11 and 12, which we'll be sharing with families and tying back to our personalized student dashboard that is being developed to give parents a better view of how their students are progress progressing towards their goals. Here on this slide, you can see grades pre-K through four and grade five and their focus outcomes. Each has literacy, numeracy, attendance, and SEL, while grade five also has a tra transition preparation focused outcome. Next slide, please. Listed here are the categories and focus outcomes for students in grades six through eight on your left and on your right, grades nine through 10. Remember what those focus outcomes, areas of literacy, numeracy, numeracy, attendance, SEL and transitions. And finally, we have a focus outcome, um, focus outcomes here for 11th through 12th grade with a focus on graduation and transition to post-secondary. All of this innovative planning falls under our umbrella of Metro Schools Reimagine. The focus outcomes tie into our core tenets, which tie into our strategic framework, which tie into our Metro Schools Reimagine, which are all going to be anchored by North Star to establish MMPS as this premier large school district in Tennessee and beyond as we envision. Just as the focus outcomes are the district's targets, the signature initiatives then connect the district's outputs. This is how effectively central office supports schools with the focus outcomes. Naming these initiatives allows us to organize the district supports and resources in ways that are purposeful and intention. Our goal here is that there will be no wasted effort. Creating and connecting district supports and services with focused outcomes and ensuring a consistent and coordinated approach to the work of central office to support schools and to ultimately improve student success. We will be able to enumerate to families and communities the district's work and what they can expect from us. Next slide, please. Here we have a representation of the 14 signature initiatives that will be rolled out later this month and the topics they cover. 
Each of these will tie back into our core tenets to operationalize them to work for our students and staff and accelerate positive outcomes for every MMPS student. You have 14 signature initiatives in front of you. Four of them are already existing that we will be expanding upon. And quite honestly, they're initiatives that we have learned from either prior to the pandemic or during the pandemic that helps us better respond to the needs of our employees, of our families, and most importantly, of our students. The other 10 initiatives are really grounded in Again, where our focus was as far as our goals and expected outcomes for our students prior to the pandemic, definitely what we've learned and uncovered during the pandemic and what it's going to take to accelerate learning for every student as we're moving forward and really thinking about our short-term and long-term goals. Again, simply put, this is about making sure every student is known. Now, I want to shift gears a bit and give a brief update on where things stand relative to COVID-19 spread in the community and in phasing in of students back into the classroom. Before I dig deep um, into that space, please know we're going to continue to dig into our focus outcomes and our signature initiatives over the next several days and weeks to come. Now, as I communicated before Christmas, we need to see the COVID-19 risk score drop below seven before we can start phasing students back into the physical classroom, starting with our students with exceptional needs and those in grades pre-K through four. Currently, we're at an 8.7 out of 10. As a reminder, the metrics that inform this risk score are found on Metro's COVID-19 website and include the transmission rate, the seven-day average of new cases per 100,000 residents, and the seven-day average positivity rate. Those metrics have been consistent. While the reported transmission rate saw some improvements last week, it has been steadily increasing, and the cases per 100,000 is at 90.5 as of this morning, and our positivity rate is at 18.6. They're both far too high. We'll need to see both of those numbers dropping significantly before we will see substantial improvements in the risk score that indicate it's going to be safer to start phasing students back into the classroom. Next slide, please. Now, as we await a reduction in the community spread of the virus, we are expanding upon efforts to make our school buildings as safe as possible for the students and staff who return. Just tonight, earlier tonight, the board approved the Meharry Medical College contract to allow us to implement testing protocols for students and staff using rapid tests and PCR tests to reduce possible transmission in our schools. Our partners at Meharry will also begin and continue to identify those key external COVID-19 compliance monitors who will help us to ensure all students and staff are following the safety protocols outlined by the district based on CDC recommendations, while also helping us identify additional steps that can be taken to reduce possible transmission. transmission. We are also optimistic about the positive impact the COVID vaccine can have for the safety of our staff. Now, unfortunately, there simply aren't enough doses being delivered to Tennessee and Nashville fast enough to immediately be available to our staff. While teachers and K-12 staff have been moved up into the 1B phase of the vaccination program, we are still at 1A2 with a significant backlog of those who qualify to receive the vaccine. So for example, there are thousands of people 75 and older on the waiting list and the number of dosages available to the community are not sufficient to quickly make it through the list. Originally, one of our large medical centers here in Nashville projected they would receive 5,000 doses a week of a vaccine. It was later clarified that all of Davidson County would only receive a little over 5,000, and that institution wouldn't receive what it initially projected. So just putting this in context of where we are with the vaccine, very hopeful, but we still are a little ways away. We are in constant contact with the Metro Health Department to determine when those doses might be available. 
And as soon as we get actionable information to start the process of signing staff up to receive the vaccine, we will communicate that out to you and to our staff. At this point, the plans released by the state indicate that it will not be until at least February and more likely March before we move into phase 1B. In order to support our public health efforts in the schools, we are also continuing to work with the Metro Health Department to, to staff those school nurse positions so we have one in every school, the conversation we just had. There is incredible market demand out there for license, licensed nurses. We have 20 nurses in the onboarding process, which should complete our goal of having one nurse in every school building. Fingers crossed that we get everybody through that onboarding process. And when we do, I think we can all agree that is a victory for which we have hoped for for a long time. And finally, in this space, I want to make sure we have enough staffing to meet the needs of students and school administrators. This week, we started a program to have all eligible central office staff to volunteer one day a week for the remainder of the school year or as long as determined um, or needed um, of their choosing. This can be everything or anything from substitute teaching to other areas of student and school support, in addition to ensuring our virtual help centers are fully staffed. So many of our central office staff members are one day given a high dose of support to schools, again, of their choosing or schools that they were already working with to make sure we continue to meet the needs of our students, regardless if they're in the virtual space and definitely when they're in the in-person environment. We're also exploring with the mayor's office the potential for Metro government employees to assist in supporting our schools during this time. So we'll provide updates um, in that space when they are available. Next slide, please. So helping to fund some of these initiatives will be the new stimulus package enacted by Congress just before the new year, which is being called the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund or ESSER 2.0. As a reminder, we received $26 million in this funding last year that went toward purchasing PPE, supporting teachers and students in virtual learning, sustaining our nutrition services efforts to provide meals for all students, and other important programs. This time, we are receiving more than four times that amount, which can be allocated and spent through 2023. We're looking to fund all of the allowed categories with the exception of planning for long-term closures because that is not our focus right now. Our focus is getting students back into the classroom when conditions allow for it. Also, funding for existing staff isn't necessary as we have not seen as great a reduction in our operating budget this year as some districts across the country have experienced. Though, as you recall, we did have to institute budget reductions in order to adjust to additional mandatory expenditure increases in the 2020-21 budget. Now on this next slide, you're going to see um, here the four main buckets um, in which we're planning to allocate our resources. While $123 million sounds like a lot of money, given the significant needs of our district and the students we serve, in addition to required allocations for charter schools in Title I funding for students at private schools. Fundamentally, our plan puts a focus on investing in our students and our people. The four categories include COVID response that includes items such as the Meharry Partnership for testing and monitoring, which we've discussed tonight, facilities improvements in areas such as AV HVAC and air quality, our school nurse program, which we've also talked about tonight, and our new ongoing nutrition services needs. Academics to address learning loss and the necessary professional development and stipends to support efforts above and beyond our normal offerings as a district. In addition, social emotional learning supports such as advocacy centers, mental health, and training around trauma-informed and restorative practices. We also have focused in on transitions for summer programs, extended learning, and college and career preparation. We're working with our team to put together program information and cost estimates to determine what can be funded through these funds. 
We intend to provide an initial funding list by the end of the month to comply with the state and federal requirements. But just like ESSER 1.0, those items may be amended or extended as more information becomes available or other funding streams or programs are offered to meet the needs of our students and staff. So again, just an overview of where we are with ESSER 2.0. And before um, we finish our uh, presentation today, I, I am going to kick it over to Dr. Lisa Norris um, and her team, who's going to give us an update on our Metro Schools Reimagined plans around moving fifth grade to elementary schools, starting with the Pearl Cone, Maplewood, and Weiss Creek clusters. Um, so um, at this time, I'm going to turn the mic over to Dr. Norris. And then once we finish there, uh, Madam Chair, we'll kick it back over to you, Dr. Norris. Thank you so much, Dr. Batto. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. Again, my name is Elisa Norris. I'm the Executive Officer of Strategy and Performance Management. And it's my pleasure, along with my colleague, Mr. Ryan Latimer, who is the Director of Boundary Planning, to share with you some fifth grade transition planning updates. Next slide, please. As a reminder, this is part of the, the reimagined work that we've started at the beginning of the year and that we've kept pushing forward. And this is one of the uniform strategies that we have committed to, which is to return to this pre-K, K-5, 6, 8, 9, 12 school model. So this is part of the uniform strategies that we know will push the work forward, certainly, and will support our students as they continue moving forward. Next slide, please. And this is part and parcel the, the pathway to success that we've imagined for Metro Schools Reimagined. We're asking ourselves the question, what do we need to do in elementary school so that we can prepare our students for post-secondary success and opportunities? And so we know then that in elementary, it is about laying the foundations for continuous academic and SEL improvement and development. It's about sustainable practices that will certainly support our students in their engagement and their achievement. And then transitioning, you see in between, making sure that we have robust transition plans in place so that once they get to high school, once they leave our shores, metro schools, they will be successful in whatever post-secondary opportunities they see fit. Next slide, please. So here we are, returning to the, the clusters that we started with Metro Schools Reimagined. Again, to Dr. Battle's point, we started with Maplewood, Pearl Cone, and Whites Creek, and this is where we are beginning that transition fifth grade back into the elementary space. But as a reminder, here's our, here's our reimaginings for each of the clusters, right? And it was about returning to what was already working in the cluster and taking to scale those best practices so that we can reimagine the opportunities for our students. So in Maplewood then, we reimagined creating that feeder pattern as a unified, branded, AVID program cluster, right? And we see the schools here that, that are in the Maplewood cluster. Cluster. Next then, it's Pearl Cone. And Pearl Cone, we imagine creating that unified Music City Arts. We have Pearl Cone High School as the entertainment magnet, already the hub, and then bolstering that health sciences uh, pathway so that we can have that cluster. And again, you see the schools that are in that cluster and that feeder pattern there. And last but certainly not least, Whites Creek. We reimagine then for Whites Creek, creating those early college opportunities so that our students have the opportunity to graduate with both a high school diploma and a associate's degree. And so here are the clusters. This is where this fifth grade transition work is going to begin. Next slide, please. So the argument then for this move, right, is that our, our own data shows us that students who remain in the fifth grade in the fifth grade setting in elementary student, fifth grade students as a group, rather, who remain in the elementary setting outperform their peers who are in the middle school setting. What we've also learned and listened to is our parents and our parents have indicated to us that they wanna keep their students in the fifth grade setting as well. And then for our state standards and our curriculum materials, the packaging, it's along these particular grade bands, K2, 3 through 5, 6, 8 in high school. It makes sense then that we have our school set up in that way. And additionally, state teaching licensing, licensing requirements fall along these bands. So definitely we have lots of evidence and data to prove, to demonstrate why this is the move to make. Next slide. And so this fifth grade transition is it's built upon those domains that undergird the work that is Metro Schools Reimagined. It is about looking at leadership, instruction, culture, and systems. So as we are working through these plans for this fifth grade transition back into elementary setting, we are looking at leadership and asking ourselves, how do we ensure that there is going to be very strong, robust cluster collaboration and alignment, right? Creating that opportunity for true K-12 alignment. 
Additionally, we are ensuring that there are going to be focused central office supports for, tra for transition planning, and that will look like principals, central office support, district support, executive directors coming together, working together so that we can ensure that we have the very best plans. Around instruction then, it is about providing those additional PD opportunities for our students, to our teachers rather, to make sure that they are well prepared for this new teaching opportunity. And then also it's about early planning to support our EE and EL service delivery models. Thinking about culture, it is about, and Dr. Battle referenced this early in her presentation, it is about making sure that we have those age appropriate uh, developmental supports around SEL and also creating opportunities for those middle school experiences. So important to the Metro Schools Reimagine work is transitions. How do we how do we shore up those transitions so that as they move from elementary, middle, and high school, they can continue to gain momentum, um, certainly toward their post-secondary success. And so it's about creating those opportunities around culture and then systems, right? We know that it is it is it is because of strong systems that our students can be successful. So we understand the need then for a robust communications plan to reach multiple stakeholders, making sure that as our fifth grade students move back into elementary, they have the furnishings that will support them as they're doing their learning. And then also being creative around scheduling so that we can ensure that our fifth grade students, even as they're in the even as they are in the elementary setting, they are prepared for the middle school experience. Next slide, please. So here are some questions. Here are some questions that have emerged as we begin this planning, certainly around after school care at the elementary school. And yes, fifth grade students will have ac access to that same after, after school care. Um, will fifth grade students at elementary school take related studies classes? So fifth grade students at the elementary school will have access to similar scope and sequence instructionally, and then also access to music, art, and physical education opportunities. Um, class size, the average class size then when we make this move will be 20 to 25 students per class. And then is there any additional documentation that will need to be filled out? No, our students will automatically be assigned to classes and no additional steps are needed. And so part of our planning pr process is to create these FAQs so that we can share them out with our different stakeholders so that everyone is well informed of what this will look like moving forward. Next slide. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Ryan Latimer, who share a little bit more about what we have at work. Mr. Latimer. Hey, thank you, Dr. Norris, and good evening, board members and Dr. Battle. I have just a few slides to discuss on what moving to a K-5-6-8 configuration would look like in Maplewood, Pearl Cone, and Whites Creek as it relates to the student assignment planning and the facility utilization. But as I begin, I did want to share a map that details what it will take to move all of MNPS uh, schools to a K-5-6-8 configuration. Uh, so this map shows all the district elementary schools, the little various colored dots on it. And behind that are the high school clusters in various shades. Uh, the schools are broken down into really four different buckets. Uh, the green schools are those that we can go K-5 in right now, so they have the capacity to add the fifth grade. As you can see, the three clusters we're talking about tonight are all in the green. The yellow schools are those that are have high populations of out-of-zone students, and so to go K-5 there, we just need to reduce the out of zone enrollment for one to three years a little bit to create the space to add the fifth grade in those schools. Uh, the other two colors, the orange and the red, are loosely related and we'll be adding, um, we'll be working on going K-5 in those schools over the next few years as funding allows. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next three slides we've shared before, and I'm going to go over this one in more detail and then just go over the highlights on the next three. Um, this sh slide shows three years of enrollment history uh, in the Maplewood cluster, the projected fifth grade class for next year, which is currently their fourth graders, so it's assuming that all of those kids would remain there for fifth grade. Uh, the current utilization based on the October enrollment of 2020-21. Uh, the next column is the initial projection uh, for the K-5 grade configuration. And this factors in uh, the school's current enrollment 
rolling their fourth grade to fifth grade and a percentage increase for returning to a normal school year. So if you're following along with Ida B. Wells, there's 229 students now. We would add 50 for the fifth grade. And then the, there's about 16 students in there that we would add for returning to normal, which brings us to the two, 295 students. Um, for the Maplewood Elementary School cluster, this would add roughly 270 students and would bring the utilization in the elementary schools from 56% to 71%. Uh, Jerry Baxter would become a 6-8 school and would see an enrollment decline. Um, overall, we, would ex we anticipate adding 322 students in the Maplewood cluster through this move. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for Pearl Cone, the elementary schools in this cluster would add 214 students and the utilization would go from 36% to 46%. Uh, John Early and McKissick would both uh, become 6-8 middle schools and would see an enrollment decline. Um, overall, the Pearl Cone cluster would add 226 students. Uh, next slide, please. For the Whites Creek cluster, the, this transition would add 168 students to the elementary school tier and would increase utilization from 68 to 85 percent. Haynes would become a 6-8 middle school and would see an enrollment decline. Um, overall, the Whites Creek cluster would add 176 students. And just a quick note, um, as we do this transition, the capacities for some of the middle schools will change as it goes from a K-4 configuration to a K-5 configuration. And so it's just converting a few rooms that are typically staffed at 20 to one to 25 to one. And so for Alex Green, for example, when we add fifth grade, it would add 10 students roughly to the capacity and it would go from 349 to 359. And uh, thank you for your time. That's all I have. All right, next slide, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Latimer. And so I want to share with you a timeline that we're working under. So on January 7th, we had an informational meeting with the principals who will be who will be affected by this transition, this first round of transition. Um, and so as a result of that, we have put together an ongoing planning team. And this planning team will consist of principals, district support, and executive directors. Certainly we have principals and executive directors who have gone through this process and gone through it successfully. So we'll be leaning on their wisdom and their expertise and their experiences to certainly help us with this plan. Um, January 19th, we will have an informational meeting with fa faculty and staff at the schools that will be going through this transition. There will be a community meeting on January 21st from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. to share with our community stakeholders our plans regarding this transition. And then just to note, the choice window opens on January 25th. And so this is the timeline we're, we're, we're operating under to ensure that we are well positioned and well prepared for the start of next school year. Next slide, please. So with that, I want to certainly thank the board for your continued support around this. We're excited. We know that this is the move to make and under the umbrella of Metro Schools Reimagined, it is about reimagining what is possible, what is the biggest, brightest future that we can imagine possible for our students. And we recognize the opportunities that are presented to us moving fifth grade back into the elementary setting. So with that, I'll say thank you again. And Dr. Battle, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, um, um, Elisa and Ryan for um, updating us, updating the board with regards to where we are with our reimagined work. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, board members, um, for your engagement. And Madam Chair, I will turn it back over to you um, at this time if there um, are any questions or follow-up needed. Thank you all so much for this. I'm sure we have some questions. Uh, I see Jeannie Pupo Walker, go right ahead. Uh, if you would just turn your camera on if you'd like to ask a question or feel free to text me, I'll, I'll watch my phone. Thank you so much for that comprehensive report. I have a couple of comments and questions. I'll start with very specific questions for um, Ryan. So you talked about the moving of kids down to from fifth, you know, to the to the elementary for fifth, but you talked about how there would be a net increase in, in enrollment in each of those clusters. How is that happening? Uh, what we've done in Antioch, we're kind of looking at it there, is the, the retention rate uh, with the fifth grade, so moving fourth grade to fifth grade has been high. And so it's adding that kind of factor into it. 
Um, so that's where we think we'll see the gains. We think the students will stay with us through the fifth grade and that that's going to increase enrollment, whereas they tip in the past, they may have gone on to choice schools or other schools or left the district or those kinds of things. Gotcha. Okay. So you guys are hosting a community meeting on the 21st from 6 to 7. Is that for all of those clusters combined? Um, I believe that it is, yes. Is there a world in which we could do more than one meeting for an hour? I don't know if we could do it by cluster or if there's plans later to do it at the school level or yes um, mm -hmm. we're, we're gonna we're gonna do one at the district level and then we're gonna work with the schools to do individual school related uh presentations gotcha okay um so very excited to see fifth grade moving to elementary that's long held gold it's actually something i campaigned on so i'm gonna check that box here by the, in a year or two so um i want to i want to um I want to start by talking about the, the, the other portions of the presentation. Um, the personalized student dashboard, I think that's a fabulous idea. I'd love to see um, parents and students and teachers um, get the skills and the ability to, to have meetings together around that dashboard, setting goals together, being able to talk together about academic goals, um, personal goals, SEL goals for students. How, how soon do we think that dashboard is going to be up and ready to go? Um, Ms. Wibble Walker, I'll take that question. Um, Dr. Paul Changes is not on the call, I don't believe, um, this evening. If you are, Paul, feel free to chime in. Um, Dr. Changes, who is our Director of our Research Evaluation and Assessment um, Department, is leading this very exciting effort. So first of all, thank you for um, acknowledging the work that is in, um, in, in the works right now around launching a personalized student dashboard. And this speaks to our goal to make every student known. And the one thing that I know I consistently have heard from parents, um, that I've heard from other stakeholders, is that parents want to know, where is my child right now, right? We've had a very tough 10, 11 months now. Uh, with the pandemic, um, including the tornado that happened before the pandemic, and parents want to know. And so we'll be launching this personalized dashboard that is grounded in our focused outcomes and key data points so that parents and students can be empowered um, to know where they are um, and really to help partner and take ownership and, uh, and making sure they have the appropriate supports um, and service to, to progress along. And so we're really excited about the personalized dashboard. Dr. Changis and his team, along with various stakeholders, are leading um, this work. And our timeline for um, this school year um, and, and a little bit later um, this spring is to do the initial launch with the initial data um, that parents and students um, will have at their disposal. And we're talking about there will be parts of it that will be internal facing, but lots of this will be external facing that they will have access 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So uh, within the next few weeks to months, we'll be doing our goal. Our plan is to launch the personalized student dashboard. And then we have um, a very aggressive timeline um, year over year of how we are planning to expand um, the personalized dashboard as our parents and students begin to interact with it, having an opportunity to tell us more about how we can personalize those dashboards and how we can get the line supports in play um, to make sure that if a student, for instance, is off track with their literacy focused outcome, that they can um, take a look in that personalized dashboard about what to do next. Um, so to create those strong, strong partnerships, total engagement around where every single student is um, so that we are transparent and keep that ongoing communication. So in the next um, few weeks, a month, we'll be launching the personalized dashboard and it will continue to expand um, over time. Will that dashboard be longitudinal or will it have data year upon year? Is that the goal? That, that is the goal. Yes, that is the ultimate goal. We're going to focus first on um, aligning um, the focus outcomes to those um, to the focus areas that we've identified. So we're going to start in the spaces of literacy, numeracy, SEL, um, both academics, um, excuse me, both SEL competencies and attendance, and then we'll continue to expand from there. So uh, we're really excited about this initiative. We've received um, very positive feedback from all stakeholders thus far 
um, about this tool being available to our students and families. And it, it, it will be um, a growing um, dashboard. It won't be perfect um, when we launch it um, for our first go, but our goal is striving towards um, their perfection. So everyone has what they need at their fingertips reach. Okay, a, a couple of more questions. So the signature initiatives, 14 of them, a lot, yeah. right? Um, do you feel like y'all have the bandwidth to, to work in 14 areas or do you feel like they're bucketed into areas that are aligned to your focused outcomes? A great question. Um, yes, 14 different signature initiatives. I will remind us that four of them are already initiatives that are in play that we've learned from that we want to leverage and scale up. Um, so for instance, um, the virtual health centers is um, uh, one of our virtual, excuse me, one of our signature initiatives. We launched the virtual health centers as a part of our response in this pandemic, supporting our students and families, both in the technology space, but it has really grown and expanded to all things. I mean, families, if you're listening, if you need support in any way, please come out to our virtual um, health centers because you will be met with a team uh, poised and ready to support. Uh, we thought that those virtual health centers would be kind of a temporary um, support to fill the gap. We have served thousands of families through our virtual health centers. And so our commitment is, um, to your other question about capacity, is to coordinate our efforts. If this is the need that our parents and our students um, have articulated to us, then we need to align our efforts and coordinate them um, to make sure that we can expand our virtual health centers. We are so very um, laser focused um, on these signature initiatives to make sure that they are aligned to our core tenants to our focus outcomes. If, if the signature initiative did not help us accelerate outcomes of our focused outcomes, we're not, it's not a signature initiative going into um, the second semester and beyond. So we really charge central office or our support hub with reorganizing themselves, um, reprioritizing to make sure the efforts we have in play meet our capacity to support the focus outcomes that uh, we're launching this this month. Okay. So I'm going to quickly jump to the ESSER 2.0 slide that you had with the four areas where you were going to prioritize investing the money. And so, you know, I don't know if you put them in order of priority. There was the COVID recovery and then there was real learning loss, SEL. I can't remember what the fourth one was now. Transitions. Transitions, thank you. Um, I really want to uh, thank you, whoever's doing that. That's not it. Um, I really would like to know what data we're going to be using to identify how we're going to talk about the learning loss, how we're going to identify, identify kids for summer uh, support, for after, for extended learning. Um, all the PD. I'm wondering what voice teachers are going to have in sort of designing some of this. If we're going to, if we're going to ask teachers to identify where they need support, where they think we need to double down. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, what data are we using? Map? Are we using other things? I, I'd love to just get a sense for how you guys are thinking about prioritizing the, these strategies. Yes, our primary um, uh, source of data with academics will be our map um, assessment. Uh, we're also having ongoing conversations with our school teams about other pieces um, of data that um, they have that will help us um, have a clearer picture around where our students are. But the, the, the common uh, piece of data that we'll use will be map assessments, but we will leverage other um, data sources to um, formalize our plan. With regards to um, teacher input and voice, we will be, uh, we're already in the works of um, launching um, a survey to our um, entire awesome. district um, to hear from our staff around where they see us leveraging um, these funds to be best suited to help them serve their students in their classrooms. Um, I do want to call out here that these buckets, uh, which um, do align to um, the application that we've received, um, align to our focus outcomes. So we are being very targeted and strategic here that uh, we aligned our funds to help you know, first and foremost, our COVID response so that we can accelerate getting our students um, back in the school, but academics, SELs, and, and transition. It transitions is what you saw in those focus outcomes. So we will continue to leverage um, our ESSER 2.0 funds um, in that way to identify gaps and to accelerate outcomes for students. 
the, the last thing I want to say is I'd love to hear from you all a sort of a, a reflection on last semester. Uh, you know, we've heard from a lot of parents whose students have failed classes where they've never failed before. And, you know, we know that there's been high levels of absenteeism. I'm, I'm just curious. I'd love a, to get a, a sort of an honest discussion about what were the highs and lows of last semester? What have we learned? How do we how do we dig in on that information to make sure we can get back on track this semester as much as possible? Um, so I, I know it was, you know, huge learning curve for everybody, but I'd love to just let's have the, the, the candid conversation about how, how it actually went. So yeah, and I think that will be an ongoing conversation and um, a reflection of what you've seen tonight um, and with our focus outcomes and through our six signature initiatives of what we're going to do about it um, because we've identified those as challenges and gaps. It speaks to our reflection of what we've heard and what we've seen, what our data is suggesting um, our students need, um, our supports around to again close those gaps and really maximize the opportunities. While the last um, several months have been very challenging um, and tough on everyone. Uh, we also want to elevate the opportunities that have been uncovered to help us um, again drill down to the individual student. This is not the time to stay at the district level with a percentage count around where we are with um, our literacy scores, our numeracy scores. What our students deserve and what our parents need for, for us to do it's a drill down to every single student. So, uh, Ms. Paul Walker, I, I uh, always welcome that ongoing conversation, but uh, rest assured that through those focus outcomes, what you see in the strategic initiatives and how we're looking to leverage um, these funds all speak to um, our reflections um, of, of where our students are and what's been articulated to us. Okay, thanks for your time. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Pupo Walker. Thank you, Dr. Battle. Next, we have um, Vice Chair Rachel Ann Elrod. After that, we have questions from Dr. Gentry. Again, board members, if you have any questions, please feel free to just turn your, your camera on or just text me so I can put you in the queue. All right, Mrs. Elrod. Thank you. So I'm going to probably start from the, bot the end of the presentation and work back uh, towards the top. So on page 23 was the um, district-wide map, thank you, of the K-5 configuration study. So my question is, we obviously have a strong number of students, uh, schools that have available seats for K-5 configuration. Um, when are these schools, since it seems like it might be a more easy or turnkey option for them, when are we planning on having these schools uh, be turned into K-5? to Are we gonna try to do that right away? And if not, why aren't we prioritizing them since they already have the capacity in space? Um, thank you for that question, absolutely. So as we're thinking about looking at the other schools, we're also trying to make sure that they fall in line with the ways in which we are rolling out clusters per the Metro schools we imagined. And so as we are looking at each school and each cluster, we wanna make sure that we have an opportunity to do a deep dive into what the academic needs are, what the culture community needs are. And so as we look at the, the first three clusters, the Whites Creek, Maplewood and Pearl Cone, we will be returning to the drawing board to look at the next three clusters that, to your point, where does it make sense to do this move next? And so certainly we have many opportunities available, but that will be as we continue to roll out Metro Schools Reimagined cluster by cluster as, as each need makes itself known to us and so that we can prioritize. Yeah, and, and as Dr. Um, Norris um, just mentioned, um, if you're looking at this map, the reason we are starting um, in the Maplewood, Pearl Cone, and White Creek clusters is that's where you see the majority of the green, um, that those um, cluster schools were primed and ready to go given the capacity, um, also given the previous conversations that they have um, been engaged in. And to, to put this simply, because we want to do this well, um, and, and not fast. Um, when you're talking about changing grade level configurations, there's so many moving pieces, uh, one from you know parent support, student support and communications, um, to teacher staffing, um, to curriculum needs. Um, so we wanna make sure that we are um, ensuring a very smooth and successful transition for families um, and staff um, in this space. So we had some learnings out um, in Southeast. We do have a couple of 
um, elementary schools that have gone K or pre-K five. Um, we're taking the lessons learned from that space. And, and we know um, that in order to do this well, we need to um, kind of think quality over quantity, um, knowing that our ultimate goal is that we will face fifth grade back um, in all of our elementary schools across the district. So if we w reflect back to the previous, we don't have this slide in here tonight, but there is a slide where we've already targeted based upon our ability um, to um, ad address the K-5 configuration based upon the clusters that will fall in which order. Um, if you look further south, you can see that we're going to have to have some um, additional um, kind of capital um, adjustments in order for that to take place. And so in planning and thinking um, out there, some um, physical um, capacity issues that we'll have to address first before the students can transition. So we've tried to take a very um, uh, measured approach um, to making sure this happens across the district, starting where it's most feasible first. So if I understand that correctly, so the Whites Creek, Maplewood, Pearl Cone were prioritized for se probably several reasons, but one is because of the available seats that are there. So if that's the case, then it would, I would assume the next, the next cluster would probably be McGavick and then the Overton or Cane Ridge cluster. Is that how we're trying to make that decision? Um, and I'm, I don't have the chart in front of me, but I think it's McGavick, uh, Hunter's Lane, um, is also um, in that area. Um, and then there's one other cluster that I'm, Stratford might be um, in the next yeah. um, area, but it gives us an opportunity to plan out um, a year or two to address the um, capacity needs and or um, the seat adjustments to make sure that we can make this happen um, in every school, every elementary school. So what is our timeline of when we think all of these, I'm just gonna say the 39, cause I understand we have so much fiscal concerns that we have to worry about with the orange and red particularly, but just with these 39 available seat schools, what do we think the timeline is for those? Um, Ryan or um, probably Ryan, do you wanna um, address that question? I'm happy to chime in. Yeah. if. We did say the, the three clusters uh, north of 40, the McGavick, Stratford, and Hunters Lane next. We would probably be looking at starting those uh, K-5 in 2022 or 2023. And then th the rest are gonna take a little bit more work. So if, if you think about the four kind of quadrants, um, Ms. Elrod, um, we, we definitely know this is a four to five year phase in uh, when you're thinking about it in those terms, particularly because with this first round, uh, we're looking at the implementation of for the 21-22 school year. Um, so we know that this phase in will take at minimum four years, um, so at minimum four years to make sure we hit each of the, the four quadrants. Okay. I guess my, this is not so much a question as it is feedback. I would like those schools with available seats to be prioritized, um, maybe even outside of the cluster conversation, um, particularly if we're gonna say that this is a potential enrollment boost for MMPS and we are trying to come up with ways to work on our enrollment, uh, particularly considering our enrollment concerns of this year, though I understand we believe that kindergarten will be a boost to that next year. Um, so my hope is, is that I, I believe that K through five is an enrollment boost. I, I, I agree with that data. Uh, that makes just logical sense. I know for my own district, we had a school call that uh, has moved to K to five and it's been wonderful for that school. But um, I would like that those schools, since that, that seat, those seats are already available, I would like that to be prioritized, maybe even outside of the cluster. Um, and if I can, so one quick thing. Yeah. We are prioritizing based upon available seats, um, just to be clear there, which is why we're moving um, into the next um, set of clusters um, next. But I also want to, because we've had these, we've been having these conversations for um, over a year now with the steering committee uh, with Metro Schools Reimagine. It's important that um, while it will increase enrollment, um, likely, uh, we want to make sure that 
our students and families are having a successful pre-K um, five experience. And that in itself, um, I think will speak volumes um, for our families. And so again, just being mindful of um, all of the moving pieces with regards to staffing and the impact it'll have um, on middle schools, albeit there will be great impact for our middle schools as well. So um, your point is well taken and a part of the plans to prioritize where there are available seats. Um, that's where we'll be moving swiftly um, into next. Okay. I mean, I, I, I don't want kids just to go to school. I want them to go to school well. So I, I get I get that. All right. So um, I think my next question is on page 13. If I'm looking at the my deck correctly, I'm sorry, I'm going between um, open tab to open tab to make sure I have everything correctly. There we go. So um, thank you so much for doing it for me as well. So uh, my first question on the, from this slide is a common question that I receive because it's terminology that we use is people are wanting some clarification around the terminology of quote, external COVID-19 compliance monitors. Uh, to ensure protocols are being followed. Um, we just started using that terminology, obviously, as we discussed the Meharry Medical College partnership, but what does that mean for us and what does that look like? Thank you for the question. Um, Hank, would you like to address that question, please? I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Howard, would you please repeat the question? Sure. So the question is, is what does, um, which is the second bullet after the main top bullet with the partnership with Meharry, it's yes. what does external COVID-19 compliance monitors to ensure protocols mean? And what does that look like? Yeah, it means having um, to contract with Meharry um, and the contract that you all approved tonight to um, be able to bring on an additional staff member to help make sure that people are actually following the protocols to be as safe as possible. So you can imagine someone, um, this person, as people are entering the building, helping to ensure that students and adults are wearing their masks properly. You can imagine that um, they are helping to make sure that uh, people are properly spaced out where appropriate. Um, the things that we know to do, but um, they're properly trained in that and are able to support the school in that important work all with a strategy to try to make the school environment as safe as possible when it's safe to return to school, um, to be able to keep us in school as long as possible. Okay, so is that someone on top of our nurses? Yes, it is. Okay, just wanna make sure we all got that. For the reason that our nurses will be very specifically dealing with student health needs um, and contact tracing. Um, and so this is to this is more on the preventative side. Okay. To that point, the contact tracing continues to be when we are in person a massive lift for us and for our staff. It not only encompasses nurses' responsibilities and in some cases takes over a lot of their responsibilities, but it, that responsibility also has spread into also our front office staff a lot of times of trying to do all that contact tracing um, within our schools. Do we, or does this uh, partnership with Meharry provide any additional assistance with that lift of contact tracing? Thank you. The public health department has offered to provide some additional support as they change some of their practices. Um, this compliance monitor would also be available to, to support, um, but no doubt um, it, will, it will still be a burden um, and a, and a all, all consuming process. Okay. Okay, um, I guess my quick follow up to that is if the public health department is providing those extra people, is that an additional contract that we would have to be a part of? No, no ma'am, thank you for clarifying that. As they have adjusted how they contact trace the general public, um, they have freed up some additional public health um, people to be able to support the schools. Okay. So it's not something that we contract with them. It is it is their staff as part of the uh, COVID process. Okay. And then um, at the bottom of this, where it says expanding substitute slash support pool, um, I understand that we're trying to be creative with how we um, have more what we call day to day substitutes. Um, right now, our substitutes are required to have sixty hours 
from an accredited college or university to become a substitute. If we're needing to expand our substitute pool um, and available, if we need to increase that and have more people be able to be a part of this pool, do we need to decrease that number from 60 to another number or why are we not changing that? Dr. Bell, you're muted. I assume you said go ahead. I'm, I'm so sorry. I was talking. Yes, Chris Barnes, could you please address Ms. Elrod's question? Yes, ma'am. We looked a few years ago at whether before I arrived, whether we need to reduce the amount of requirement. I think it is a question of quantity over quality. Um, the one thing I did most recently was go do a um, salary review of all the large districts and all the districts surrounding us about how we paid our substitutes. And we are paying them at a rate comparable or above everyone else that may be the next step we take is to look at reducing the requirement, but we wanna make sure that we have the quality that we want for, for our schools. Um, but it's something we can explore, of course. Is that 60 hours uh, comparable to other districts of our size? Is that um, a standard or best practice? That is, um, from because I asked that question today, actually, that's what's normal. So we can reduce it if we want to. Um, the other thing we're looking to try to do is, well, I guess it's it's in the budget request later to try to encourage schools to have a permanent sub where they can have someone that, that comes to their location every day to help uh, bridge some of those gaps as well. Do we already have permanent sub or floater subs at every school when we're open in person? We don't. Um, they're usually driven right now by SmartFind where you put a vacancy into um, when you know it's coming this would, would try to encourage to have someone at every school every day. Okay. It's something I did when I was a principal because there were only, I think, two days in the entire school year where I didn't need a sub. And so for the most part, they're, they're there to help you bridge those gaps or those late breaking vacancies that sometimes happen where, uh, you know, the child's sick at three in the morning and you can't go to work the next day or you have, um, you yourself get sick right before school starts, those sorts of things. And that's going to be something that's coming up as a budget request or conversation in a future meeting? Uh, yes, ma'am. It's something we're looking at for next year. Okay. Right now, what we have done in the COVID response time is we do have everyone has been offered a permanent sub. Uh, we don't call them a permanent sub. We call them a school-based sub um, who goes to every school every day. Right. But continuing that practice. That would be our what we explore. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, well, if we haven't looked at the 60 hours for two years, obviously we weren't dealing with the current circumstance two years ago. Um, I would like for us to reconsider that and see, I don't want us to hurt our quality of what we provide, of course, for students, but if that is an obstacle that we need to overcome um, and it's a hindrance to us getting students back in schools. And if it's a, a, a real issue, we need to really consider, I think, this reducing the amount of hours that are required. I'm not saying eliminate, and, but reduce. And, yeah. and Ms. Elrod, um, forgive me for interrupting, and Dr. Barnes, you'll probably add in a few more details. There are also two different types of substitute teachers that we're talking about. Um, a support substitute is just a high school um, diploma and so that is what can help us fill some of these gaps and so you're correct that and the, but then the substitute teacher pay um is is the uh 60 hours so that's a differentiated factor and dr barnes or dr battle you can add more details in there right no we also do scale our our, our salary not salary but we scale the amount of sub is paid based on their amount of experience and and either licensure, school work, that sort of thing as well, so. Got it. All right, thank you. And then, um, let me try to make sure I have these slide numbers correctly again. It's just one slide up, it's slide 12 for the phase in planning. Thank you. So with our new partnership with Meharry, and our ongoing conversations with the health department and the COVID-19 task force. Um, of course, we're aware that we are kind of following all this COVID-19 tracker 
Uh, with the new guidance that came out from the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, do we need to reconsider the risk score or does it need to be revisited? And how we adjust it? Sean, do you want to come on um, first and address that and I can follow up? Um, sure. Uh, so uh, the risk score is based on some factors, uh, you know, determined in conversations with uh, health officials about what 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 constitutes a safe environment. And so, looking at our numbers currently in Nashville, we're at a pretty high level um, that we're much higher than even when we contemplated when we developed the risk score because we're, you know, not at, at 90 uh, cases on average. That's a seven-day average of cases per. Um, for seven days, and so what we're trying to do is see those numbers decline. Um, the the information that we've received is that um, schools can be safe if the community spread is lower. And right now, we are just at the peak of peaks right now. So I mean, we're we're at blood red if you look at the charts of um, of states in the country. And so if we were to move uh, to a place of for instance, a, a positivity rate of even 10% and a cases, uh, average cases of 25 per day, which is still sort of on the high end, you would maybe get below seven. So that's that's kind of where we're looking at right now. Um, we need to see those cases go down. We need to see the community spread go down. And we haven't seen any evidence to indicate that um, uh, that a lack of, um, that, that we can open up schools regardless of community spread. And um, I believe, Hank, you might have some further information on that. Um, feel free to chime in, um, Hank, but I do want to reiterate since we've come back to slide 12, um, that while we are virtual, at least through MLK Day, which is next Monday, we will we will remain in the virtual space until our metrics um, allow for us to fall below seven, which is, gets us in the conditional range to um, begin um, the phase in process for um, students based upon the prioritization chart that we um, have gone over multiple times. So our goal beyond it, but beyond MLK Day is that we will remain virtual until our um, COVID tracker is below um, seven, given the metrics that we've discussed. And as Sean has mentioned, um, the ongoing conversations um, that we're having about uh, what those um, scale scores look like and what they mean um, in regards to where our level of community spread is. Um, but I'll pause there. Hank, um, was there anything else you wanted to add? I think you captured it well. I mean, to directly answer one of your questions, Ms. Elrod, yes, we look at all studies come in and and uh, incorporate that into the decision-making process, and then Dr. Battle and, and Sean were able to answer the rest. Okay, so because the guidance from last week is basically that um, schools don't affect community spread. And so, you know, there's arguments of that if schools don't affect community spread, then we should not be using community spread numbers to, uh, I guess, dictate our phase in planning. Um, and so I didn't know if that new knowledge would change anything for us. Um, my instinct is, is that we don't affect uh, the community spread. Community spread still affects us. Um, it may not be coming out of our schools, but it is coming into the schools. Um, and so that's why we're following these numbers. But the argument is still that we're starting to hear more of because that guidance is new um, is that because there's not a large effect on community spread based upon what happens within our schools is that maybe our risk score should be reassessed so that's why i'm asking that question and seeing if there needs to be any change to it um and then um, I'm Ms. sorry. I'm not sure if um, if you were asking a question there, um, but of course, um, with all new studies and research and recommendations that come out, we are well informed about them, and we do um, dig into um, all of them to help um, us in support of you know other health experts and and organizations we partner with. Um, but in essence, there's lots of studies and recommendations um, that are out there. I mean, even one uh, most recently that. 
um, suggest that, you know, simple correlations show in-person modalities are correlated with increased COVID um, cases. Um, you know, it depends on, again, what that community spread is, um, but also leads to another point because we've um, also addressed the question of using in-school metrics um, to, to lead to the district decisions. And I want to be clear here that because our schools are part of the community, we have to, um, and, and just about all research speaks to this, we have to um, address what the community spread looks like um, because that will ultimately have impact on our ability to be in person and to operate um, our schools fully. We do leverage the in-person um, case counts, active cases, um, transmission rates, um, and such to make school level decisions. So when we're quarantining students, when we're having class closures or school closures, that data is leveraged um, in that way. So I just wanted to, um, since we're in this space, kind of clarify uh, what data um, is most useful um, in those spaces. So school level data, school level decisions. And when we're talking about um, opening and operating, um, you know, hundreds of, I mean, a hundred schools or more at a time, um, we've got to consider the community um, spread. And, and the reason I hesitate on the numbers there is, is considering, you know, where we were with exceptional ed and pre-K four um, being in session um, during the first semester. And then my last question is, uh, I guess still on this slide, is um, a question that we're, I'm receiving more often is, can I, can we list the guidance that is given to you? And, um, and basically who is, who is um, giving us this guidance? Obviously, which we all should know, um, this was made in uh, contact with and in partnership with um, the health department, the COVID-19 task force, and they gave us even weights and we're very helpful in this creation. Um, and now that we have our partnership with Meharry, they of course will also be heavily influencing and informing us. But is there anyone else that we need to have stated that is giving us this guidance on how we're making these decisions? I'm not sure if you mentioned the Metro Health Department. I um, didn't. Yeah, Metro Health Department um, as well. You mentioned our partnership with Meharry. You've mentioned our COVID task force um, team. Um, so all of those individuals, um, along with all of the recommendations, including the CDC guidelines that come out um, that help um, best inform. So we are well partnered. Um, in this space and we have ongoing um, conversations in, in all of these spaces to um, help advise around the best uh, plans for MNPS and what you hear us articulate and what you see in our COVID matrix and how we have rolled out our phase in plan are all representative of those conversations um, around the best way for MNPS to be responding um, in this time of the pandemic. I will pass it off, I think, to Dr. Gentry was next. Thank you for entertaining my questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We have Dr. Gentry, then we have Mr. Little, Mrs. Poopa Walker, Mrs. Masters, and then um, Mrs. Tyler. If you, okay, well, Mrs. Poopa Walker is out of the queue. So Ms. Gentry, Mr. Little, Ms. Masters, and then Ms. Tyler. If you have another question, please just let me know. All right, go ahead, Ms. Gentry, Dr. Gentry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just, uh, I think, three things I want to ask or comment on. Um, on the slide that speaks to COVID recovery um, as one of the four or five areas um, that we're going to be prioritizing, um, yeah, so the COVID response. What I am, and I guess it, that would fall under learning loss because um, it all feels like COVID recovery to me. Uh, how are we, um, uh, the assumption I'm making is that we're using this new approach of understanding where students are individually to determine what that response in the academic space needs to look like. Um, my question is, from a budget perspective, um, is, is that, and you may have said this, is that all CARES dollars? Is it any CARES dollars? Is it something additional that we're planning to ask for? And at what point are we going to be able to quantify what that ask is? That's my first question. See, Dr. Battle, I'll be glad to hop in here. Um, thank you, Dr. Gentry, for that question. Yes, um, this side, this slide is specifically 
related to what we plan to use ESSER 2.04. Mm -hmm. um, and that application will open at the end of January and we're excited to get in our application. In addition to that, um, the State Department of Education has withheld the maximum amount allowable um, for the State Department of Education instead of distributing additional amounts of districts. And so I would imagine that we might see additional grant opportunities from the State Department of Education um, if those align with our strategic interests as a district to serve our students then we would like to apply for those as well. An example of this past of ESSER.1, uh, ESSER 1.0 is that they ended up um, releasing grants for technology and we took advantage of those. Thanks Dr. Gentry. So what I would suggest, and I think this goes along with a, a question Ms. Pupo Walker asked about, um, you know, dollars that we receive that we apply and, and I don't, I don't imagine that whatever we get will 100% address, and I'm just specifically focused on the learning loss right now, right? Um, so I would uh, curious about: Are we have we identified sort of resources and and structures and pl things we've put in place during this remote learning time? You know, whether it's virtual, um, the virtual supports and things of that nature that could then be repurposed to continue to supplement whatever the grant dollars uh, don't don't address. Yes, Dr. Battle, you may add additional color here, but um, but yes, throughout the pandemic, we have sought to um, people have taken on all sorts of different tasks other than what they typically do to adjust to the new environment. Um, and we are all in probably the biggest example of that is um, uh, of um, people from the district support hub going out to schools to help to provide what, what schools need during this time when there's lower staff, Dr. Battle. Yeah, Hank, stay, stay on because I'm going to ask you to just walk through a brief um, example of this. But um, just keeping in mind that, you know, within this year, we have been leveraging um, our operating budget. We've been leveraging ESSER uh, 1.0, which hasn't expired yet, right? We we have um, um, aligned all of our dollars to the efforts that we have in play. Um, now we have the ESSER 2.0. Now we're embarking upon um, our next um, fiscal um, um, operating budget. And so we are being super mindful of where, where we leverage dollars, particularly when you're talking about one-time calls, particularly about the caution you have to have when you're talking about one-time funding and adding additional staff. But I think one of the perfect examples here, um, Dr. Gentry, is how we've been able to leverage and or, um, in other words, stretch our ESSER 1 um, dollars based upon grant opportunities um, that we've taken advantage of. So Hank, if you could just kind of walk through real quick um, how we leverage in the, um, I think technology space might be one, uh, how we were able to stretch our dollars to meet more of the needs um, given the, the various pots that are available to us. Yes, thank you, Dr. Battle. Um, so as as you all likely remember, Mayor Cooper um, very generously and early announced um, giving $24 million towards student laptops and devices um, and hotspots. Um, Metro Council uh, then supported that as well. And subsequently, the State Department of Education ended up releasing um, competitive grants, which we uh, competed for and won about $11 million. And so then we were able to repurpose those dollars go back to Metro Council and um, and ask to be able to repurpose the $11 million offset to take further advantage of those. And so um, it's trying to leverage every penny of operational dollars, um, federal dollars, state dollars, et cetera. So my, my thank you for that. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm always, we're always leery of, you know, temporary dollars and, and making sure that we are, we're being um, proactive or forward thinking about what the world looks like for us when the need remains and the dollars are, are gone. So I appreciate that. My final question, and Dr. Brado, we, we, we've discussed this in our one-on-one uh, -on -one time or in our time uh, yesterday, and I just wanna just put it out there. I've literally gotten at least two texts about it um, during this meeting. Is when we talk about, again, knowing where uh, each of our students are individually and, and sort of elevating 
some data about our students that we may not know, right? Um, and so, you know, as, I, as in our conversation, I used the example about how you know, everyone was, you know, had their anxiety or their concerns or their displeasure around No Child Left Behind, and it created a lot of a lot of drama. But the one thing that it did, right, is it forced us to disaggregate data and look at subgroups of students that we normally did not talk about. We talked about district performance, we talked about school level performance, but we didn't talk about those subgroups of students who were still struggling. And so now I think we're moving to a point, right, with uh, what you're proposing, that we're even disaggregating that data even further. So I'm not talking about the black males in your school or the EL students in your school. I'm talking about Ryan Gentry in your school uh, and understanding clearly um, what her performance looks like, um, to Ms. Walker's question, what her uh, performance looks like year over year, um, even when she crosses tiers. Um, we get to understand how we have impacted and more importantly prepared that individual student. Um, so what I, I want to ask is when that individual look um, highlights uh, a need for that student, and you've, you've spoken about that, this goes back to the conversation we had around student-based budgeting, and I just want to be clear the connection between now understanding what the 312 students in my building individually need, what does that say to the student, to the budgeting process for the school? Yeah, um, great question. Um, the first thing is, it is about every student being um, known and drilled down to every um, student. We will continue to disaggregate, look at um, our subgroups and gaps because we want to make sure that, you know, even across the board, we're talking about district level supports, um, that we're addressing any disparities um, that we may see. Um, and we know that our kids are persistent. Uh, we know that we have very skilled um, students, but as we drill down um, to those individual data points, I want to just first highlight that, you know, there are going to be some uncomfortable moments and times where we have to um, acknowledge where our students are and um, how we're going to have to be more aggressive around getting them where they need to be. So I just want to start that first, because just because we'll roll out a, a pretty nice um, personalized dashboard, it doesn't mean that the information within it is going to paint a rosy picture. Um, it likely won't, um, but we are um, ready for the conversations and the challenges and to support to make sure we get our kids where they need to be. Um, and to your more specific point around how this approach um, differs and impacts um, our student-based budgeting, what it is going to do is help um, our principals and our school teams um, be even more specific and tailored to the unique needs of their students by how they allocate funds, about how um, they leverage their school improvement plans um, to um, justify, if you will, I don't mean that in a, you know, take anything negative about that out, but just to um, articulate um, and be able to communicate why the, um, the staffing, the resources, the supports, the um, experiential learning, um, the filters, why they all look the way that they do. Um, how they'll be able to articulate uh, with their advocacy centers who those advocacy centers are staffed with, right? It's not, it should not be the district's responsibility or desire um, to dictate that for schools. Um, the whole goal here is for school teams and school principals to be able to leverage their student-based budgeting um, to staff their school, to program their school, um, to make sure they have the core instructional uh, materials in their schools to align to the needs of the students that they serve. So uh, with this approach, um, school principals will be equipped with even more clarity around uh, where their students are um, as individuals, um, where each student is, and what is necessary to move them forward. Dr. Gentry, thank did you have, go ahead. No, thank you very much. That's all I have right now. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Little. Okay, and can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, so one, like, um, thank you for just putting this together just as a new board member, being able to read through this plan um, and continue to reference back. I think it's super duper helpful. Uh, I think on two parts, just two questions so I don't take up a lot of time. One is around equity as I think about the whole district and then the other relates to district four. Um, and so one of the things that Jenny brought up when we talked about um, community support um, or community meetings, 
what, how do we solicit and maximize feedback from the parents, teachers, and other stakeholders? I know it initially looked like one meeting and then someone um, talked about it a bit more, but how do we go, how do we really maximize the feedback? And then a, a suggestion um, that I have, um, we used to have family engagement specialists in the district and we have, we have taken that away. I don't know what that looks like um, in this new world as I hear from parents um, and students talk about the, the need for support. Um, how can we repurpose some of the funds to include like family engagement specialists who are socially distanced, who are really able to communicate within their clusters um, with the families? Um, thank you, um, Mr. Loder. I was trying to capture um, some of your questions there. Um, first, let me address the um, family engagement specialist, um, which is um, still connected to our work. And Dr. Springer, feel free to chime in um, as you need to under our student support services umbrella um, with our community schools uh, approach. But fundamentally, um, Ms. Loder, what I will respond to that as or with is that it is important that as we're looking at our student-based budgeting, that we're looking at this through that equity lens, um, as you mentioned, and pushing down those funds so that schools can invest um, in the personnel, the program and the supports that they need um, to help support them um, in this space. And we've tried different approaches um, as a district because we have had family um, engagement specialists um, at, at the district level. And Hank, you might even want to chime in um, to that and what that currently looks like. But also, how can we look at that through the equity lens to push those resources down to the schools or across, uh, forgive me, across to the schools to make sure that they can plan and um, ensure they have the right supports in place um, for for their students. And uh, unfortunately, Ashford uh, was not able to be um, on the call tonight. Actually, uh, Ashford has rejoined oh, us. Okay. He is sick, but um, he is on. Okay, Ashford is on the call. So Ashford, if you want to come on and address um, even more specifically the equity question, and Hank, if you want to, Hank or Michelle, if you want to add anything to the family engagement specialist, feel free to do so. Thank you for that, Dr. Battle. Uh, good evening, board. Uh, to your uh, question, uh, board member Little, one of the things that we've worked on uh, via that lens is looking at how do we engage student voice. Uh, we've been working with student services to actually put together the protocol, the guidelines, and the toolkit to be able to help teachers, principals, district leaders understand and recognize how to engage students and how to utilize that student input in decision making. We are working on the same thing with Community Achieves to make certain that we have these same toolkits, these same guidelines to be able to work with and support our teachers, our principals at the school level to be able to do this type of uh, community engagement, parent-teacher involvement so that we can co-create these uh, school climate and, and great spaces together so that our parents do have input for where we want to be. It is right now in its early phases, but we have uh, really got two strong frameworks that we want to utilize to be able to make this come to life. And right now, we're still in the planning processes. We've been working with students, and not just some of our students at the highest levels, but students from all across the district at certain at di at different levels in order to create this framework for student en en engagement. And we're going to be utilizing that with uh, some of our parents in processes right now. We've been working to build these frameworks out. Uh, and this fits in across the district, across all of our uh, 14 initiatives to be embedded in that work as well moving forward. Thank you, Ashford. Even even sick, you're more eloquent than I can ever be. Um, Mr. Little, uh, the uh, question about the family involvement specialist. We had um, uh, one for each cluster uh, for many years. And in fact, um, when Ms. Poop Walker was a, a uh, district employee, she led that team and can speak a lot more detail than I can about it. Um, a few years ago, uh, the district had to make the difficult decision to cut those positions as part of um, some of the, um, the budget cuts to maintain other services in the district. Um, since then, some of the research has evolved to um, suggest that we, could, we should focus more on the family engagement work at the school level. 
Um, and so as additional resources become available, I would imagine that's uh, that's where we would focus our work, but um, but uh, engage in conversation and it's something that I know we're all very passionate about. Mm -hmm. Yep, and, and, I, and I appreciate that. I, I just would think with 80 plus thousand students, like I think it would be a good investment. This is just my, my um, opinion that it would be a good suggestion, even if it's only for a few years, because I think what I hear from students and parents, like they're really suffering and the community's achieves program is going really well. Um, at the Two Rivers Middle School, we have a really good one who's like a rock star, um, but I think we need more um, as we think about the academic part. So as we look at the priority area, areas and the examples, like thinking how can we repurpose even to do a trial run to see how we can get that support um, into some of our schools, whether it's individual or cluster. Um, that's, that's just an opinion. Um, but my next question goes right into District 4. Um, and as I'm looking at that, I guess this is on page um, 23, the K through 5 configuration. And a, and a lot of these questions, people have already talked about specific to their district, but I just wanted to make sure I, as I look at the McGavitt cluster and I look at, you know, most of the greens, I think we have one yellow that is in, um, I think that's Stanford Montessori. Like how can we, I know we talked about Mr. Lattimore said 2022, um, or 2023, but I didn't know if it was an opportunity and we can talk offline just as we look at our cluster because in district four, we lose so many students between the transition of fourth to fifth. And this could be, although a temporary band aid, but it could keep more students in, inside the district, especially as, we, as we're going through COVID. So it's just a, a, a question if it can be moved up, but I'm, I can talk offline about it if need be. Um, thank you, Ms. Little. We'll we'll continue that conversation for sure. Yes, ma'am. That's it on my part, Chairwoman Bucks. All right. Thank you. We have Ms. Masters and then Ms. Tyler. Thank you. Um, okay, I had um, one of my questions is just about. Um, as we come up on school choice and what kind of events we might be holding for parents, virtual information events, or if they're going to be able to do some virtual tours of schools. I know this is the time of year we'd normally be doing our tour Tuesdays. Um, and so I just was wondering, um, and I apologize if I missed it um, in the presentation, but what we could let parents know that they could do to to get educated about their different options um, before they do that application. Thank you, Ms. Masters. Um, Ashford or Sean, um, would you all come on to address Ms. Masters' question, please? Um, certainly, I'll, I'll start off, Ashford. Um, Feel free to take it over, but we've uh, we share guidance with schools on some templates and, and toolkits that they can do to do uh, virtual, um, you know, tours or virtual informational sessions so that they can share with parents and, and interested families what what they have to offer as a school. Um, and also, uh, you know, part of the reason um, we're, we're also rolling out the this fifth grade um, uh, reimagined inside the those three clusters that we've identified in part because of the optional school calendar to make sure parents uh, and know exactly what their options are as we head into that next season. And certainly we'll continue to find other opportunities to sh share that uh, with the public. Ashford. I believe you've uh, established everything, Sean. My team, uh, we've been working to hold uh, some virtual events to be able to get out and have been working with the communications team online to continue communication, to make certain that parents uh, are aware of deadlines, timelines. Uh, we're in the process right now of setting up a, uh, a live event here within the next two weeks uh, to be able to let uh, parents and families know the opportunities and options that are out there. Um, I've been in contact with uh, our principals to let them know what tools are available for them for these virtual tours and to contact with get in contact with their parents and parents that are seeking to come to their school 
uh, because we are doing these virtual tours. So hopefully uh, we continue to get that message out, but could use uh, the board's help and the community help to make certain that, that they know these options are available for them. Okay, that's great. So look for a live event within the next couple of weeks and then contact the individual schools that they're interested in is kind of what I, I'm hearing, like the wrap up. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. And some of the uh, information that I provided uh, for the principals are that if they do need uh, more support to contact our office, uh, we're here to help them in any way possible to get the information out uh, via our social media or via other uh, avenues. We've also been working with the Family Information Center to make certain that they convey this information as well as parents call in and have questions also. So we're trying to work with every uh, department that touches the school options process to make sure communication is going out. That's great. And so as we approach this, this January 25th beginning to the school choice process, um, c c what are just the the snapshot of things that people need to know as far as what we're going to have for requirements for academic magnet entrance. I know it's going to be a little bit different this year um, because of lots of reasons. So um, could you just speak to that for a moment as well? Absolutely. So uh, myself and Dr. Changas have been meeting with uh, a lot of our uh, MAP and academic qualifying institutions to make certain that they know what the upcoming qualifications were uh, and to make certain that they were also communicating with parents. Uh, Dr. Changas met with a group of principals today to make certain that that communication was going out as well. Um, we will be distributing to the principals, I believe next week, the upcoming the updated booklets to be uh, getting out to principals. We also put that information out on a, a lot of our social media outlets. Um, and we still are working with, again, the uh, Family Information Centers to make sure that they have that information. And they've also been conveying that information when parents call in to inquiry about when does the process start. Uh, so we've been trying to, again, get that communication out as best possible. Uh, we've been conveying this before we left for the uh, fall break, for Christmas break, uh, to principals and hopefully uh, that message has been getting out through their channels, through their parents, and we're going to continue that process until the close of the lottery. And just to follow up on that, Ashford, too, if anyone's interested, uh, the, the magnet requirements and other information is available on mmps.org slash school dash options, and you can go on there and um, the, the booklet is live now and um, you can find out whatever information you want, whether it's mag academic magnet requirements or other information. Dr. Bellamy, I think you were going to say something. I was going to chime in, Sean, with a less articulate and informative answer than you just gave. So I'll just go with what Sean said. And if you have any other questions, Ms. Masters or board members, any of your constituents are welcome to email me directly. And if I don't have the answer, I'll certainly get them to Mr. Hughes or to my um, executive director team. And so, as always, if there's a question that uh, you, you need help answering as a board member, feel free to connect them directly to, uh, to me directly. Okay, that's great. Um, I have two more questions and I'll try to keep it short. And the, the next one is also um, sort of relates to um, this issue of school choice. Um, with our rollout, going back again to our rollout of the um, fifth grade in elementary schools, which I love and 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 having a child who went through um, that transition into fifth grade in middle school, um, she actually had a really great experience, um, but I also went along. It, I, I was had a lot of nervousness over my ten-year-old being in middle school. So, I think that developmentally, it's very appropriate to be moving in this direction. However, I do have some concerns about um, how slowly we are going to be moving because um, it is my fear that, especially um, given the clusters where we're going to be beginning with adding fifth grade, that that is then going to sort of um, cut off the perceived necessity on the part of those elementary schools to share information with families about um, school choice options like the academic magnet schools. So, um, you know, my fear is if, if the schools at K through five, why are we even gonna bother kind of sharing with them, hey, your kid has really great test scores and grades and they should consider applying to the academic magnet middle school 
Um, and if they remain in their elementary school through fifth grade, then that, that option is essentially cut off for them because there's not a lot of open spots in um, the academic magnet middle schools in sixth grade. Far be it for me to say that the academic magnets are, are the be all end all. We have amazing community schools, but I just would hate to think that we are sort of inadvertently creating an equity issue here with this slow rollout of the addition of fifth grade and that we're, it actually may result in us having um, even less of our higher risk students applying for positions in those academic magnet middle schools. So I'm just wondering if someone could speak to that it's just one portion of this plan that that gives me pause. So I was wondering if we could talk about that for a minute. Ms. Masters, I'm happy um, to respond in this space. And so um, I, I, because I know the work um, that the team has been engaged in, um, they might suggest <laughs> that we're moving pretty fast in that we know we have uh, pockets um, across the district where we can't go there yet because we have um, capacity needs. We we are considering um, equity um, as a part of this and, and, and how moving too fast can also um, cause that as well. And so if you remember back to our capital improvement budget, we had some um, elementary um, spaces on there, um, but we're still um, uh, a year or two out from those schools um, being built. And so we decided let's not wait for that. Let's create our plan. Let's go ahead and start making the moves uh, where we can as those um, buildings and facilities are constructed. I think one unintended consequence here is if we move too fast, I mean, there are just some unfortunate things that would happen like um, fifth graders remaining at elementary school, but they're in portables. Right, like, do is that a trade-off that we're willing um, to 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 take or or make here? Um, same thing on kind of the instructional quality, um, and so we're trying. I mean, to your point, however, we are trying to strike. Um, a fine balance. It, it's not to say that we um, get in kind of a rhythm here and can expedite um, some of these um, as well. But you can imagine trying to um, undo, if you will, um, this structure. Um, it is taking um, some time to, to get at. So we will continue to keep that um, at the forefront of, of our planning and our prioritization. And we've, we've heard it a few times um, on the call tonight. And if there are spaces where we can accelerate, we will. Uh, but in this next round, um, all those little green dots uh, most of those little green dots will be cared for um, and there will be other balancing and uh, facility needs that we will um, have to address. So again, point um, taken, uh, but we also want to be mindful of some of the trade-offs that come with moving um, too fast. And, you know, I, I also understand that elementary parent who has the third grader and you missed that year, you know, you're the year after um, that transition uh, happened. So we'll, we'll keep that in mind, uh, but knowing we really want um, a quality um, experience. The one thing I keep pressing upon my team while in and the enrollment numbers matter, um, the success of our students matter more. Um, and so let's let's you know let that drive um, that enrollment piece, which I think ultimately um, because of the satisfying experiences parents will have, students will have in our elementary schools, it, it will uh, produce those outcomes that you've articulated. So we'll we'll continue to um, bake that into our planning um, as a team. And if there are spaces um, for acceleration, we will definitely prioritize that. And com so, commu communicate, mean, yeah. that, communicate that and prioritize it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, and I, so, I mean, there, there will be a point where, for example, um, a 100% academic magnet middle school will have fifth grade phased out, I, I would imagine. Correct. Because it would no longer be a necessary, I mean, it wouldn't be a logical entry point anymore. And one of the things I want to call out, because we do have a few of our elementary schools that have gone pre-K um, five, the the richness of the conversations with the principals in our planning team, I, like 
amazing. I mean, the, the 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 level of planning, the questioning, the support that is there for the principals who are transitioning um, their school teams um, will, I think, only continue to get stronger um, as we move through this process. So with that, um, there might be opportunities that we can we can definitely move along um, a lot quicker. But um, again, kudos to all of those who are lending their time and, and expertise. We know that Cane Ridge Elementary, um, Eagle View Elementary, and Cole Elementary um, are those three schools and those three principals um, and their executive directors have just been amazing in supporting these schools who will be transitioning next year. That's great. Um, thank you. Okay, now to shift gears one more time, I have one more question. Um, so this goes um, to the, the partnership with Meharry, which I'm very excited about. Um, I think it's, they're just an amazing asset to our community. And I know that it's through some resources there um, that we've been able to come up with some of the metrics that we're using um, around COVID right now. Um, I just, I want to talk for just a moment about, I understand their role in testing, which is very valuable in vaccine distribution, which is gonna be very valuable. I just, I saw this one word on that slide. I saw the word monitor, um, whereas where maybe I would have liked to see the word support. So I just wanna be sure that the role of um, the folks from Meharry within our schools is not going to in any way be sort of focused on being punitive, sort of a, a gotcha, we're monitoring your protocols. We're gonna see whether or not you're doing this right situation. Um, because we've we've put so much on our individual school leaders and I think they are doing a really great job of implementing protocols. And so I think the support and the help um, is wonderful, but I also, um, you know, I think we need more help. We don't need more people with clipboards, you know, going through saying, oh, are you doing this? Oh, are you doing that? Let's say no clipboards, just helpers. And so I kind of just want some clarification um, about the clipboards. <laughs> <laughs> Hank, um, you can come on and I will um, assure you, Ms. Masters, it, the, the intention here is to do the opposite here. Uh, part of having the compliance folks there is that we're asking our principals, we're asking our teachers, we're asking our support staff, we're asking them to be the educator and the health expert at the same time, right? And yes, we're getting nurses in school, but we know what their responsibilities are and how their responsibilities um, will be expanded. And so um, the compliance um, officers or monitors, however it's um, listed, are there to take on um, the, the health component. I mean, one thing that would make me nervous um, as a, a previous principal coming into this space is, I don't know what I should what I should be looking for, much less you know if things are um, where, where they should be. And so the compliance um, individual there is just to be that extra set of eyes to take that off the plate of the principal um, and the leadership team and the teachers and the support staff and the counselors so that they can focus on um, you know supporting our students um, socially, emotionally, instructionally um, as well. But um, Hank, I don't know if there's anything else um, you want to add there, but the intent was let's let's let our teams do what they're trained to do, what they're skilled to do, um, and really pour into our students. It, 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 it just aligns to how we started out the school year. Take everything off your plate, connect with your students, learn their needs, align your supports and your instruction um, to get them where they need to be. But Hank, I'll pause there. Anything else you wanna add? Dr. Battle, you captured it perfectly. Um, uh, that is that is certainly the heart of it, uh, Ms. Masters. Thanks for uh, the cold read of that word uh, yeah. monitor, and uh, perhaps we might think of using another word because what Dr. Battle just explained is what they're intending to do. In addition to that, uh, the first part of your question, um, they will be helping us make sure, because they're the public health experts, that we are advocating for our students, our staff, our school-based staff, our teachers, to the highest degree possible with the vaccine distribution. Um, we wanna make sure that we don't make any missteps, that we are exactly where we need to be in that distribution plan. Um, they have the ability to help administer the vaccines. Um, in addition to that, they are liaison with us with Vanderbilt and with the public health department um, because those are the three um, main distribu uh, um, vaccine distribution points. 
So that's on the distribution side. Uh, on the testing side, what they will be doing is helping to establish a statistically significant volunteer-based sampling to identify any potential hotspots that might emerge so that we're um, A, ensuring as safe environment as possible when we're able to safely return to schools, uh, and B, that we have really accurate data to be able to make well-informed decisions about what are happening within our school systems. Um, so they, uh, they know all the different types of tests. They're able to design it for us. At the beginning of the pandemic, I joked that um, you know, I wasn't a uh, expert um, in uh, epidemiology. I'm still not, but I'm getting closer closer there. And uh, but indeed, they are the true experts. Um, and so, and I, as far as I'm concerned, let's do all immunizations in schools. <laughs> like, let's just bring it. But that that point aside, um, I I think that that functions fantastic. Um, but. And Ms. Masters, uh, that is an important thing to bring up about where vaccines can happen. Um, the Davidson County strategy is because we, unlike some of our rural counties in Tennessee, can maintain the cold chain, um, we are focusing on the Pfizer vaccine distribution at this point. Um, and so uh, that does mean that we have to make sure that people can go to specific sites where they can maintain that cold chain. So one of the common questions that's come up is, would we, for example, be able to distribute at our Vanderbilt um, uh, wellness centers? And the answer currently to that is no, um, because of maintaining the cold chain. Um, although, uh, of course, the situation continues to evolve and, and we'll stay on top of it. That's great. Um, how many Meharry folks will we have? It will be one per school or sort of a distribution or? What, what we've done with that for the, um, the support for the COVID compliance um, uh, is uh, ensure that there's at least one per school for the same reason that's important to have a full-time nurse for every school. And then um, we've bucketed schools that are with larger populations to be able to provide more. Um, for the testing, um, we will have sets of teams that would be um, enough teams to be able to get to all the sites that we need to, um, uh, to do the testing. Okay. Uh, but they would be roaming. They wouldn't be, the testing would not be static to one school. It would be a set of teams that um, go through a set rotation throughout the schools. Okay, thank you. I'm sure we'll cover more of this in the meetings to come, but I appreciate that, that overview for now. Thanks. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mrs. Me uh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Tyler. Great, thank you. Um, I just want to follow up real quick on Ms. Masters' questions before I ask the one. Um, I know that Meharry wasn't actually able to physically receive any of their vaccines because they didn't have a large enough cold storage space. And that's one of the reasons why they had to make that partnership with HCA. So I just wanted to ask, um, how is that going to work with them partnering with us if they don't have them at their sites? Or are they going to kind of be more of a go-between with other hospitals that do have the storage for the cold um, vaccine to, to safely hold the cold vaccines. Uh, Ms. Tyler, thanks for that question, Dr. Bedd. I'll just hop in here. Um, that actually is not accurate. Um, okay. They do have um, uh, extensive cold storage. Um, the state, for reasons that I'll let the state explain, chose not to recognize our historically black college and university uh, that provides this um, this service for uh, the community um, and has been at the forefront of COVID-19 strategy for the whole community for um, months and months now. Um, but that was not the reason. They do have cold uh, storage facilities. Uh, they do have, in fact, um, 2,000 vaccines, for example, currently that they're working on distributing to their facilities. It's just um, they were somehow overlooked during the first round. And HCA, as another good community partner, uh, was willing to share some of their uh, vaccine allocation with Meharry. Well, that's exceedingly disappointing to learn, but thank you for sharing that. I'm glad that you cleared up that miscommunication of mine. Um, now I think even less of it. So <laughs> um, I, if we could go to the slide that's um, titled Strengthening Safety Precautions. Um, so Um, 
Um, there we go. Um, so under the partnering with Meharry, where it says developing plan and implementation for vaccine distribution as they become available, will part of that plan rollout include prioritizing our exceptional ed teachers and our elementary ed teachers since they're the ones that are going to go back first? Thank you for that question, Ms. Tyler. Yes. Um, uh, so we uh, will um, be using the same methodology for um, rolling back, uh, rolling back in. I'm hopeful that when they are able to get to us, that it's actually um, not that large of a population once they get to us. And so I'm hopeful that within a, just a, uh, a relatively short time period that we're able to get through all of those. And so prior, if you're able to do that, prioritization becomes a little bit less important, but, but you're correct, the prior, that would be the priority in ranking. Great. Um, and will we include um, our para pros in that that group of special ed um, teachers who are able to get the vaccine first? I'm glad you're calling attention to that question. Yes, it's all sometimes people use teachers as shorthand, mm -hmm. um, but it's all school based staff, uh, including our very valuable para pros, um, some of whom are the most intimately in contact with our students. Um, it also includes um, uh, our front office staff within schools. Um, it would also include our transportation and nutrition workers. Um, all of our workers are extremely valuable. We care about them greatly. Uh, all of them come in contact with our students and all are equally important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's really good to hear. And, and Ms. Tyler, while we're on this slide, um, in case this was a question, um, there's a graphic on this slide of the estimated timeline and that was pulled directly from the Tennessee Health Department. So this is not a MMPS um, um, assumption. <laughs> this is what's being communicated to us about uh, where we might be in that timeline. So just wanted to clarify that. Great, thank you. Um, and then kind of sticking with the same slide, once once we've all of our teachers have had the opportunity to be vaccinated, um, both doses of the vaccine, will you choose to reopen schools regardless of the metrics at that point or will you still be following the metrics? Um, I think the simple answer um, to that, uh, Ms. Tyler, is that what we are anticipating is that the vaccine will help expedite um, our ability to get students back in school. So, um, you know, we're looking at this timeline. We see February to March. Um, yes, we'll continue to follow our um, um, COVID tracker, um, but our ability to get our teachers and our staff vaccinated will matter um, in our formula, in our plan to get students back in school. So I um, greatly appreciate the advocacy to move um, school-based staff up to 1B. Um, and as soon as we can get um, through round one, round two, um, or to know what that exact plan is going to look like, that will definitely factor in um, to um, our ability to uh, move along in our phase in. Great. That's good to hear. Um, and then my last two questions had to do with the slide that um, was about how we're going to, how we want to prioritize our ESSER 2.0 spending. I think it's just two down. There we go. Um, so one of the things I noticed on there was that the, um, where is it? thought I saw something about its specifics. Oh, it was, okay. Well, I know that when they gave the money that one of the things that they, that the um, state put as a category was mental health services um, and also um, addressing the unique needs of special populations was on there. And so I just wanted to double check and see, um, are we going to be able to add extra supports for our special education population? Um, and I mean, they're the ones that I'm really the most concerned about because of the um, really the inability to meet all of their needs virtually. And so, um, I want to make sure that we are really prioritizing all the supports that we possibly can for them. Yeah, thank you, um, 
uh, you might have been referencing, it might have been slide 14, where that yeah. was called out as one of the options. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, and um, part of why we grouped it that way on that slide was to articulate um, the second bullet, addressing unique needs mm -hmm. of um, special uh, populations. So that will um, continue to be um, an area of focus, but we'll do that through those buckets that are there. We'll, we'll be leveraging them through academics, through the SEL supports that are needed, um, as well as transition. So absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure that they don't get lost in the shuffle. Um, I know they're, they're not a very large population, but they are particularly vulnerable. So we really have to make sure we're taking care. Um, and then the other question I had was about um, increasing our mental health services with those dollars. Um, are we going to be trying to do anything where we could go to homes, where we could make more home visits for some of these families that we are um, more concerned about than others? And are those dollars going to help pay for that? Is that something that we're already doing? Have we already stepped up some more of those at-home visits? I mean, just want to make sure that we are doing everything we can to meet the mental health needs of our students while they're virtual. virtual. So lots of um, trains of thought here. Um, I think going back to something Dr. Gentry uh, mentioned, we're in the space right now of trying to stretch every dollar so to leverage them all. And so we're digging deep into um, the impact that all of our mental health strategies are having on students. So we know specifically where we need to leverage. And we're also um, considering a strategy by which we, um, again, partner with our schools for mm -hmm. them to make even more targeted um, um, decisions around um, their individual, each of their student needs um, in their school. So we're, we're assessing it all. That's why um, we're kind of ahead of the game. The application doesn't even, we won't even get it um, to the end of the month but we're early planning and already had a good idea about where we wanted to go. So we're not um, to the to the T there yet exactly which direction we're going to go, but we are considering both. One, leveraging supports that have been in play and expanding on those given the success or the return on investment, but also um, how our um, schools might even be more suited um, to make those informed decisions. Okay, and then to just to tack on to that, will some of those kind of newer or beefed up services be available for teachers as well, um, extending more mental health services to them? Because I know they're they're struggling. Yeah, um, and that's why I started out because there's lots of approaches you can take uh, with leveraging, um, you know, ESSER funds, and we are committed. I mean, our our approach here is not about. Um, adding staff with one-time money that we won't be able to maintain, but investing in our students and our people. So yes, ma'am, is the answer to your question. Great, great. Um, well, I think that that hits everything I had um, for questions now. It's been a long day, so I might come up with something later and I'll just email you if I do. <laughs> no problem. But really, I appreciate the time and the effort. I know we've been here for a long time, so I appreciate the, the patience as well. Thank no you. Problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tyler. Mrs. Poopo Walker. One very, very short question. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. um, so are we saying that we will not open schools? Let's just say the tracker goes down below seven before the vaccine is ready in an ideal world. Are we still saying we would not open prior to having a vaccine or are we saying we're waiting for the vaccine? Um, so just thinking through your question here. So we will continue to follow the tracker um, for- it's not, a, or it's not a prerequisite to opening is to have the no, vaccine. No. So we will saying. continue to follow the tracker. And what we're going to be informed about is once we get to the space of the vaccine being available to our, um, to our staff, that falls into the bucket of strengthening our ability and our plan to get students back in school, which you know, there there should be some correlation here <laughs> once we get to that space of, um, um, you know, larger numbers of Nashvilleians being um, vaccinated at that at that point. So until that point in time, we will continue to follow um, the the tracker um, to make the most informed decisions around when it's safer for students to return to the in-person environment. Um, and then as we as we receive additional information about timing and how long it will take to get our teachers um, in line and um, 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 vaccinated, then that will be added into our approach um, by which how soon we can get 
um, students back in. But it matters. Again, the advocacy is huge um, to move us up because I do believe it gives us a better chance um, to getting students back in um, schools um, faster. Of course, the, the vaccine will not be mandatory in this particular space, but we will continue to encourage and educate um, our staff um, about um, this opportunity and what it can do for um, them as an individual, but also our ability to operate as a district. Okay, I just think I families are going to gonna be. Go ahead, Hank. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Pippa Walker. I might add to that. Um, you know, we hope that the there's two factors here: um, the amount of supply of uh, dosages of vaccine that um, Nashville, as a county, gets. We hope that the feds increase that in a smart, strategic way. And we hope that the state passes that along to our to our um, community. Um, the other side is, although um, if fewer people were to take advantage of the vaccine, our school-based staff would be able to get uh, get vaccinated sooner. Um, the more people who get vaccinated, the hopefully the community spread will start to decrease. Um, and so it's really important that anybody who's eligible um, and uh, to take advantage of vaccine um, when they when they can when they can get there when it's uh, safe to do so. And then also please continue wearing your mask because we know that that has uh, very similar effects as having the vaccine um, if people would just wear their mask. Okay, I just don't want us to be seen as being coy, right? If we with prior to a vaccine, let's say it just takes forever, right? But if we're saying, I mean, we need to say the words, right? If we're saying not likely to the vaccine, because I think parents are watching this, these metrics and we're saying we're gonna, if there's a drop for five days and blah, blah, blah. I just want us to be very crystal clear and transparent with our, our families about where we are and where we're headed. So I'm, I'm not asking for any additional comment. I just wanna make sure we are transparent about what's required to go back. So, okay, thanks everybody. All right, thank you all for these comments. I have just a couple, many of them have already been answered, so I hope not to hold us long, but um, I just wanna be clear. Are, is there any additional funding that's required for that transition back to fifth grade when it comes to reimagining and, and shifting to those three clusters, shifting down to elementary schools for those three clusters, or is it something that we need to continue to advocate the, the council for specifically around that fifth grade transition? We will definitely need continued advocacy. Um, however, we are able to make the transition next year without um, additional adding additional capacity. There will be some some things we have to consider, like you know the curriculum going down to fifth grade, the furnishings for students um, in the school. But as far as capital needs, um, we can um, address these first three um, clusters first. Um, but as we continue to quickly um, expand across the district, we will need continued advocacy both in capital budget and operating. Okay, so right now operating budget increase would likely be minimal. You know, there might be some funding that's needed, but it, we're not in jeopardy of not making the shift because we don't get enough funding. That's correct. All right, sounds good to me. Thank you. And then with that in, in mind, are, is there some kind of idea around how we would hold middle schools harmless while we make that transition? And what I mean by that is if I have a school like a Jerry Baxter or uh, name any other middle school that's in one of those clusters that um, ends up with lowered enrollment than they had previously by 100 students that could result in, you know, several hundred thousands of dollars, if not a million dollars. Is there a way that we can still make sure they have the programming and capacity supports they need while we make the transition? I'm going to ask Chris Henson to come on and answer that question. And um, I might have to um, follow up with a little tender love and care um, for, our, for our principals after we hear the reality um, of how um, SDG okay. uh, works. So Chris, you want to come on for just a moment? Sure, and, and thank you, Ms. Bugs, for the question. Uh, similar to, to really what we did this year when we had lower enrollment with our schools, uh, we did make budget adjustments uh, to those schools' individual budgets to be fair and equitable to all of our schools. Um, based, you know, their school-based budgets are very heavily influenced by their enrollment. Uh, but to the second part of your question, uh, we're going to make sure that those schools have what they need so that they can operate effectively. 
uh, and, and provide what's needed for the students and the, and the teachers at the school. Uh, that's why we have uh, some baseline hold harmless funding within the student-based budgeting formula, particularly for our small schools, because we wanna be sure that even if it's a small school, that it has what it needs to function effectively. Uh, so we'll be looking at, at, at all of that together, uh, but there will be some budget adjustments that will be needed as uh, enrollment either decreases or increases depending upon uh, the effect that it has on the individual schools. All right, thank you, Chris. Nothing um, else to add. He did an awesome job um, articulating that. You know, and I figured as much, I just want us to be aware and be, be ready to advocate the community around their human capital investment, especially considering that we're looking at um, the choice fair, the, the, the school choice timeline that we only consider closing schools when enrollment is just that low. And, you know, we had to have those uncomfortable conversations a couple of times this past year with community members and let them know that we appreciate that you want the school building open in your in your your zone or in your neighborhood or around the corner from you but we would ask that you consider your neighborhood school you know that that is another one of those legs that the the table has to stand on to make sure that you know the student gets everything that they need every resource that they need so kind of just a, a selfish plug to the community in support of our under enrolled schools that are are typically you know gems in the rough yeah and um, if, um add to that um Ms. Bugs, part of part of this transition plan um, has been tightly um, planned that no staff member as a result of fifth grade moving back to elementary um, uh, job position, let's say their their position within the district is not in jeopardy. Uh, okay. We will be we will be ensuring that um, in these spaces, every employee lands um, somewhere, hopefully a school of their choosing. And we're gonna support them um, to that degree, whether they be staying at their current middle school and moving to a different grade or role or transitioning potentially to um, to fifth grade um, at their feeder um, elementary school or some great place uh, within the district. So we're gonna support our staff um, to that degree. Um, but we're also part of this reimagined work is shoring up those pathways, which means that our middle school teams are going to be um, hard at work continuing to um, shore up um, their pathway and their middle school experience, which we have heard and we know uh, we need to continue to uh, pay attention to um, and execute well in that space. Perfect. All right. Thank you for that. And uh, with that in mind, the meeting, the, the informational meeting for families, I'm making the assumption, but just want to make sure it's said to the community that those will be virtual, those that are happening throughout this month. So anyone in the community has access to them so you can understand what's happening with MNPS and what the transition will look like. Um, and I just have to say thank you so much for this shift toward equity to really elevate the concerns of our neediest schools and prioritize and making sure that those who have been traditionally under-enrolled and under-resourced, that we're, we're making a move to better support those families, those students, and those schools. So I appreciate kind of being unapologetically equitable by making sure we actually focus on those schools that, that haven't had the resources they need. Um, I do have a question about the, um, we talked a bit about community achieves and parent advisors. And I know we had to cut more funding this year or this past year, and that was quote unquote central office staff, but that is, that's who central office staff are. Those are navigators. Those are um, just supporters in other ways. Community achieves, you know, often those, those, um, those full-time employees are not based in the school, they may float. And so they may be central office staff. Is there a need for more capacity there, especially around the navigators? Oh yeah, I mean, we, we always um, have a need for additional capacity um, for sure, because I mean, as you mentioned, uh, while we currently don't have the family engagement um, a specialist role in the district, they were valuable um, to the district. And so when we're talking about um, the caseloads and the time um, and energy put forth by the school level teams and by central office. We always are in need of additional capacity. And let me just put this plug in. When you're talking about making every student known, you have to have the capacity in order to make that happen. It doesn't happen 
when you have large cohorts of students because the um, easy thing to do is to continue to treat them as a cohort um, mm -hmm. when that happens because numbers are so great. So if 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 our goal, if, if we believe um, in our approach to making every student know, there will have to be additional capacity um, in various ways um, to make sure we're meeting the unique needs of our students. Perfect. Um, I think that's just another good talking point for the community or another good perspective to add to them and to encourage them to see the central office staff that they've been, you know, they've been called central office for so long. It's hard to make that shift to thinking of them, to think of them central office staff as support hubs. But I mean, I think about my dad and my other dad, both um, could technically be considered central office staff and both actually really support the district, but don't make the six-figure salaries that the whole community, you know, assumes central office does. So this is just another great talking point around why they're so important or why we have to have more funding in so many different ways. But that's it for me around questions. Um, I think we can agree that this was a very meaty conversation, a very meaty report, but we appreciate some of the questions that will likely still come out of it, you know, days from now. So. Thank you for putting this together. Do you have any final thoughts before we move on to announcements? I do not. Um, thank you all for your engagement and for your, for your questions this evening. All right, thank you. All right, with that, we will move on to announcements. There are no reports, even though we did have committee meetings beginning at 2.30. To quickly um, remind us, we had a 2.30 executive session that's closed door for the school board and our attorney. Then we had a three o'clock advocacy meeting that was also streamed live and you can watch uh, at a, a later date. Then we had a capital needs committee meeting and we will be bringing that committee needs, committee needs assessment or budget request to the January 26th meeting. So please be watching for that. Um, and I'm sure Mrs. Tyler, the, uh, the chair of that committee will give a great recap. So with that in mind, we'll start with announcements and we'll start with District 1. Dr. Gentry. Yep, that's right. All right, sorry. Uh, District 2, Mrs. Elrod. Yes, thank you. So I have two announcements. Uh, first, we have Marie Shields at Overton High School is the new Nashville Youth Poet Laureate. And also at Overton High School, we have um, the boys and girls bowling teams. Both were able to capture the district championship um, this past month. So kudos to Overton. They're doing amazing things and go Bobcats. Thank you for that. All right, um, All right. Sorry. Mrs. Masters. Thank you. I just want to remind everyone to please wear your mask um, and stay home as much as you possibly can so that those who can't stay home are safe when they're out in the community so that we can lower this community spread um, and get the kids who want the in-person learning um, back into school for the in-person learning. That's my only announcement tonight and Happy New Year. That was a great one. All right, thank you, Mr. Little, Mr. Four. All right, thank you, um, Chairwoman sure Bugs. But I'll give a shout out to um, the Dorsey family, Patrick Dorsey, who plays the percussion for McGavick, as well as Ben Earl and Bianca Vega Ortiz. They were recognized um, for their band, for their band um, extracurricular activities. I know the band doesn't get a lot of highlight, but wanted to take time to highlight those three students, um, their juniors at McGavick. And then lastly, just an announcement just for parents and stakeholders in Donaldson, Herman Kitchen, Old Hickory. I'm going to be starting up office hours at Caliber Coffee. We'll start the first week in February. It'll be virtual, but it'll be an opportunity to hear from you guys um, as we go through this reimagine process, but also community stakeholders. And then last but not least, the community achieves um, representative um, Ms. Bond or Ms. Valentine. Ms. Bond Valentine says there's a Two Rivers Middle um, Reading Buddies program that they need help on Tuesdays and Thursdays between nine and three. So if you are interested, please look me up on social media or give me a phone call at 375-6464, um, area code 615. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Little. All right, Ms. Bush, District 6. No announcements at this time. All right, Mrs. Player Peters, District 7. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I just want to put on everyone's radar. Um, last Thursday, uh, Mr. Henson and myself um, and Mr. Hall gave a presentation to the Metro Council about Budget Council, um, Metro 
Metro Schools Budget 101, excuse me. I um, mean, you can find that on the Metro 3 YouTube channel um, or the Metro National Network channel if you just want to catch up and just familiar yourself of how do we uh, fund the school's budget from the basic. You know, today we saw the very gritty details, uh, particularly with the federal funding coming down um, to deal with the COVID, but just to give you a broad strokes about basic funding, about BEP, um, local um, contributions, the city's contributions. It's a great place to start as we go into the budget season over the next three or four months. So I just want to let the public know about that. If you have any questions, it's only about an hour and 15 minutes um, and gives you a great foundation. So thank you. And thank you for leading that, uh, Mrs. Player Peters, and thank you, Mr. Henson and team. All right, Mrs. Poopo Water District, Poopo Walker, Walker District, District 8. 8. Thank you. I want to start by giving a shout out to a very special person who um, retired from MNPS in December, and that's Donna Gilly, who was a colleague of mine and talked next door to me at Overton and um, opened a lot of doors for me. And there's never been a truer advocate for kids than Donna Gilly and wish her nothing but the best and hope to see her still making a difference. Um, I'm sure she'll be doing great things. Uh, second thing is I want to um, acknowledge all of our teachers who have done uh, tremendous work talking to their students this week about the events of last week. Um, it is, as a former history teacher, it's no easy way to talk about um, this kind of conflict and this kind of um, insurrection basically um, at Congress. And I'm hoping that uh, we had teachers able to create circles of trust and, and have real conversations about what that means and, and how to process all that. So I know that's a hard thing to do in a virtual environment. So giving a shout out to teachers for that. Um, shout out to teachers who got national board certification, including Tamika Marshall, who's somebody I have a lot of admiration for. And the last thing I'll say is uh, teachers Bianca Birdsell and Sarah Hyatt from Hillsboro put together a virtual art gallery of student artwork from last semester. I'm tweeting it out now. I want everybody to go in and take a look at all the great art from Hillsboro from last semester. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Pupo, Mrs. Pupo Walker. Uh, and now Mrs. Tyler, District 9. Um, I just want to say that um, I've had the pleasure to work with several teachers who have earned a national board certification before and they are of the highest quality. So I just want to encourage our current teachers who are thinking about it to reach out to somebody that they know who has done that, who has been through the process. I guarantee that they'll be excited and happy to help walk you through it. Um, it is truly some of the best professional development that you'll ever receive and it does really increase your, um, your ability to teach in a way that students can learn. So I, I just want to again say I, we're really proud of our current National Board certified teachers and we are very lucky for your passion and expertise. Perfect. Thank you, Mrs. Tyler. Uh, and I'd like to begin kind of piggybacking on that and thanking my friend and uh, a colleague in many ways, Tamika Marshall, for earning her, her certification. And, it, I know that it's, it can be a very time consuming process, so we don't want to skirt that or, you know, gloss over that. So congratulations to those teachers. Uh, but on a bit more of a somber note, uh, many of you may know that former circuit, circuit court judge um, Steve North, also known as Mr. Mark North's father, Pop, passed unexpectedly. And we not only send our heartfelt condolences to the entire North family, if you've never heard of them, uh, they are a staple in the Madison community and in, in so many different ways, servants of the community. I had a Mrs. North as my assistant principal when I was teaching at Neely's Bend. So our, our hearts, our thoughts, our minds are with that family. We appreciate the work that you all have done in the community and we just, um, we're with you in this. We're, we're with you in this. You know, 2020 was a trying year in many different ways. So thank you, Mr. North, for all the work that you do and for all the work your family has done. Um, I have just a couple more announcements about how the board will be operating from here on out. We're going to continue to meet virtually, especially as long as our students are meeting virtually. Uh, in you know, pursuant to the executive order from Governor Lee. But with that in mind, we've thought long and hard about how to best uh, increase fid the fidelity of the board around outcomes or discussions that we have around outcomes. So in future agendas, we'll be listing the focused outcomes and how they relate 
uh, to, to each agenda item. And I think that will help to elevate some of our conversations to make sure that we're really pulling at data, looking at student outcomes, and then um, offering our support to Dr. Battle and her team, and then communicating that out or the needs out to the community as well. So be looking for small shifts like that, um, our increase in data conversations around this table to make sure we're looking at all different demographics and how students are impacted by our decisions and even our conversations. Uh, there have been many different partner meetings around the community. If you're not familiar with, or you're, if you're not engaging your neighborhood school or a school that's close to you that you would like to engage with, many of them all, um, engage in monthly partner meetings where anyone in the community can come and kind of hear what's going on. They can lend a hand. They can hear about volunteer opportunities or donation opportunities. So please feel free to reach out to someone you know in a school or reach out to your school board member so that we can connect you uh, as a partner organization or a partner member. Um, we can't, it cannot be overstated enough how different last Wednesday, Wednesday was for many of us. If you were anything like me, you likely stopped working and were glued to your TV, just waiting to see what happened with our nation's capital. And with that in mind, our legislative session has begun. So we send again, our hearts, our thoughts, our prayers to the Tennessee legislature as they embark on this 58th General Assembly. Um, just they're doing the work of the people, so it is time to continue to advocate, but also to make sure that they are protected and safe. So just be aware, the legislative season for the for Tennessee runs from January until about May. Um, I would also like to let my colleagues know that, you know, we saw a lot of mention around professional development for our educators, for our teachers. I would love for us to get back to a space where we're offering or we, where we're engaging in professional development. I understand that we had to cut our budget, so I'm looking at other fundraising opportunities or ways to partner with community organizations that might be willing to offer us pro bono professional development or might be willing to pay for uh, us to consult with other, another organization to make sure that as a board, we are really engaging our community, we're supporting uh, Dr. Battle and her staff, and we're really moving the needle on student outcomes. So something to consider. I've been in conversation with a few different people, but I'd love to hear the board's feedback on that, uh, especially as we move into the retreat. Speaking of which, our next retreat will be February 5th. Right now, it is uh, we will likely be virtual, but the community is welcome to join us to hear conversations around the budget, around governance, around expectations, and around next steps as we continue to, uh, to, to navigate COVID. Uh, lastly, our MLK or MLK Day, the holiday will be, uh, or better yet, Nashville will be celebrating MLK Day virtually throughout this coming weekend. So please feel free to reach out to Cheryl Mays, who's in Congressman Cooper's office, as she is one of the co-chairs, or reach out to someone that you know is involved to understand how you can either be involved or participate in some way. I'm sorry, I forgot. I, I did forget one last thing. Uh, I know we've had a lot of conversations around moving to in-person versus virtual. And one, one thing that I really considered as I thought about why our perspectives were so different is that we often aren't able to share different perspectives. I know I'm in a unique position in that District 5 has all the academic magnet schools. I have many zone schools. I have many charter schools. And then I have choice schools as well. And so I'm, I'm privy to these different perspectives and understand how they work amongst each other. But I don't know that the, the greater Nashville community is aware of this. So often when we talk about in-person learning and, you know, the pockets of the community where there have been great experiences, there are also pockets of the community where it was, it was not great. And this is where that inequity has not just bubbled up, but it's increased exponentially. And I give you the example of a school in my district uh, in East Nashville. At one, one day or a couple of days there, because of so many quarantines and because they were already understaffed, we had three adults in the building, three teachers in the building for pre-K through third grade. And that was not an equitable experience for those students because they could not be taught by someone who wasn't their teacher, who wasn't their grade level teacher. And it was, it. we just got to, to remember that, that your individual experience is likely not the experience of someone on the other side of town or even down, down the street, especially if you're in areas where uh, there's very, as a very homogenous demographic. So continue to share your perspectives. Please continue to reach out to your school board member. And of course, reach out to your, uh, your teachers and your other support school staff to make sure that you get all the needs, all your needs met. Um, that's it for me as far as announcements go. Thank you all for joining us for this marathon of meetings, but be there no further business. This meeting is adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.